Being a park ranger in the Wichita Mountains is more than just a job to me, it's part of who I am. My people, the Comanche, have lived in these lands for generations. My ancestors hunted, fought, and thrived in these hills long before anyone called it a national park. There's a deep connection here, a sense that the land knows you and you know the land. But that also means you respect it, especially the things that walk in its shadows. In 1985, something happened that changed the way I see these woods forever. It's a story that most people in the area don't talk about anymore, and the few who still do either weren't there or they don't know the whole truth. But I was there. I saw what happened to those campers, and I know what killed them. It started in late October, when the air gets crisp and the wind moves through the trees in a way that makes everything feel alive. I was a young ranger then, about 24, still learning the ropes but full of pride for protecting the land of my ancestors. My shift was supposed to be an easy one, just a routine patrol near Devil's Canyon, where a few out-of-towners had set up camp for the weekend. A group of college kids from Oklahoma City, if I remember right. Six of them in total. They were celebrating something, probably just looking for a good time under the stars. The first sign of trouble came from a radio call early Saturday morning. One of the campers had gone missing. His friend said he'd wandered off during the night, probably to find some privacy, but he never came back. At first, I thought he'd just gotten lost. People get turned around out here all the time, especially after dark. The canyons echo, and the terrain can be disorienting if you don't know your way. I headed out to their campsite, thinking I'd find the guy half asleep under a tree somewhere, maybe nursing a hangover or too embarrassed to come back. But when I got there, the mood was different. The campers were frantic, eyes wide with fear, talking over each other about strange noises they'd heard in the night scratching sounds, like something moving just beyond the light of their campfire. I figured it was just a coyote or maybe a mountain lion. The woods are full of wildlife that can make you jump if you don't know what you're hearing. But there was something about the way they described it that didn't sit right with me. They kept saying it felt like they were being watched, like something was circling them. I radioed back to headquarters, told them about the missing camper, and organized a search party. We fanned out, calling the guy's name, scanning the tree line for any sign of movement. The sun was climbing higher, and I hoped the daylight would reveal something, maybe footprints or a trail we could follow. Then we found him. He was about 200 yards from the campsite, deep in a grove of old oak trees. At first glance, I thought he'd fallen or maybe broken his neck. But as I got closer, my blood turned cold. His body was twisted in a way that didn't make sense, like something had bent him in half. His eyes were wide open, frozen in terror, and his face. It was shredded. Whatever had done this wasn't a coyote or a mountain lion. This wasn't the work of any animal I knew. I'd seen death before, but this, this was something else. I called it in, told the campers to pack up and head back to town. But they refused. They were too scared to move, too shaken by what they'd seen. They kept asking me what could have done that to their friend, and I didn't have an answer. But I knew something was wrong, very wrong. That night, I stayed close to their camp, keeping an eye on the perimeter. I built a large fire, hoping it would keep whatever was out there at bay. The wind was whispering through the trees again, and every crack of a branch or rustle of leaves made my pulse quicken. Around midnight, I heard it the same sound the campers had described. Scratching. But not the kind of scratching you'd hear from an animal. It was deliberate, rhythmic, like claws dragging across bark. It came from all around us, echoing through the trees. I grabbed my rifle and scanned the darkness. My Comanche upbringing taught me to be still, to listen before acting. But there was something out there, something unnatural. And then, I saw it just a glimpse at first. A shadow moving between the trees, too fast and too large to be anything normal. I yelled for the campers to stay by the fire as I moved toward the edge of the clearing. My heart was pounding, and every instinct in my body screamed for me to leave, to get the hell out of those woods. But I couldn't. Not yet. Then I saw it. The creature was hunched low, its body gaunt and twisted, like it had been starved for years. Its limbs were too long, fingers ending in sharp, bony claws that scraped against the ground as it moved. But it was the face that froze me in place hollow eyes, black as pitch, 
and a mouth full of teeth that looked more like jagged shards of bone than anything belonging to a living creature. It wasn't just a predator. This was something old, something that didn't belong in the world anymore. And it was hungry. The creature let out a low growl, a sound that vibrated through the ground and up into my bones. It moved with an eerie grace, circling the camp, testing the boundaries of the firelight. I fired a shot into the air, hoping to scare it off, but it didn't even flinch. It was like the sound didn't matter to it, like it knew we were trapped. I backed up slowly, returning to the fire, keeping my eyes on the trees. The campers were huddled together, too terrified to speak. I knew we couldn't stay there. The fire would only hold it off for so long. I don't know what it was maybe the spirit of an ancient predator, maybe something older than time itself, but it was no ordinary animal. This was something straight out of the old stories, the kind my grandmother used to tell when I was a boy. She called them shadow eaters, beings that lived in the dark places of the earth, feeding on fear and flesh. I didn't want to believe those stories growing up, but now, now I had no choice. At dawn, the creature vanished, slipping back into the shadows like smoke in the wind. We packed up and left, the campers too shaken to speak, and I made sure they got out of the woods safely. But I knew it wasn't over. We reported the incident, of course, but the official story was that a mountain lion had killed the camper. They didn't want to spook the public, didn't want people thinking there was something worse out there. But I know the truth. I've seen it. That creature is still out there, waiting. It's part of the land, just like I am. And every few years, someone goes missing near Devil's Canyon. The reports always say the same thing scratches on the trees, bodies found twisted and broken, faces frozen in terror. Whatever it is, it's not done hunting. And the land remembers. I am a park ranger out in Nevada. There was an old, abandoned mining town that sat a ways off the main road. The park service had claimed it a while back, but people were not encouraged to visit there. In fact, it was plainly marked with signs that said, off limits, no trespassing, danger. Hell, about the only thing they didn't do was build a moat around the place. Sometimes I wonder if they should. Some people need to learn to read or listen, one of the two, because it seemed like I was always chasing people out of there. They'd look at me like I was crazy, but every one of them would spray gravel as they hauled ass after I'd tell them the story. I'm not supposed to tell the story. I've been warned many times. Even threatened with much worse than the unemployment line. I guess maybe I need to learn how to listen too. But it was the best way to make sure people left and never came back. I'm tired of being told to keep my mouth shut. I'm tired that nothing's been done about it. We rangers are supposed to just go about our jobs and pretend it never happened. Well, I believe that's the best and quickest way for it to happen again. And I never want it to happen again. It was a while ago. That's my way of saying I forget how long ago it was, but the memory is still fresh enough to tell. It was back when even I was unsure why the town was off limits. I'd heard old wives' tales and urban legends, but no one would ever commit to anything concrete. I asked around once and was told that I was better off not knowing. The old rangers would just tell me to mind my business and stay out of town. But something about it always intrigued me. I was never good at blindly following orders, so as often as I could, I'd find some excuse to drive past it. On that day, it was a good thing I did. Or a bad thing, depending on how you look at it. I noticed a small mobile home parked at the edge of the town. I knew it hadn't been there the day before. I pulled up behind it and got out of my truck. I scanned the area around and didn't see anything moving that the wind wasn't blowing. I walked around the vehicle and it seemed to be in good shape. None of the tires were flat. There seemed to be no good reason for them sitting there unless they were sightseeing. I peeked in the windshield but couldn't see anyone, so I went to the side door and knocked. Park ranger, I said. Anybody in there? The wind whistling was my only answer. I knocked again. Park Ranger, is everyone all right? No answer. I pulled on the door latch and it opened. I'm coming in, I said. Just need to check to make sure everyone's okay. I pulled the door open and stepped inside. Unconsciously, I rested my hand on my sidearm. 
I closed the door behind me, leaving the wind outside. I looked around the camper and found plenty of food and supplies. They seemed to be well stocked for a trip. I stepped back toward the bedroom, keeping an ear open for anything. It was eerily silent. The only thing I could hear was the sound of my boots on the linoleum as I headed back the short hallway. It wasn't a long walk until I got there. The bedroom was clean and the bed had been made. I opened a few drawers and found clothes for a man and a woman. There was no sign of a struggle, so I went back out to the kitchen, stopping to open the bathroom door and find two kids' toothbrushes and toothpaste sitting on the sink. Just like the bedroom, everything seemed to be in its place. I noticed the hand towel holder was empty. I looked on the floor to see if it had fallen, but the towel was just gone. I shrugged it off and went back out to the kitchen. The table was still folded down into a bed, as these smaller models were known for. Scanning around I was hard pressed to find anything out of the ordinary, except for the fact that no one was there. I stepped outside and the sun had disappeared. It would be dark soon. I looked around but didn't see anyone. It was as if they parked the camper at the edge of town and went for a walk. I stepped out of the camper and turned to close the door. That was when I saw it. There was a small dot of red on the step. I leaned closer and it looked like it could be dried blood. I tried to dismiss it as nothing. People drip blood every day for simple, non-threatening reasons. Nosebleeds, small cuts, general accidents, it could be absolutely nothing. But when you add in a missing family at the edge of an abandoned town that's supposed to be off limits, normal things don't look so normal. I didn't touch it in case it needed to be tested later for a DNA sample. And there it was. I was already starting to look at this as a crime scene. I looked down at the ground and saw my boot prints in the dirt, leading up to the camper. I also saw other tracks. There was another set of adult boot prints, a set of adult sneakers, and two different sets of smaller sneakers. Those were spooky but comforting. At least I knew these people were here somewhere. They hadn't just vanished from inside the camper. No, it was the other footprints that gave me chills. They were adult-sized, and it looked like there was more than one of them. But the creepy thing about them was they were bare feet. I couldn't imagine anyone who lived in the area being stupid enough to walk around the desert in their bare feet. Aside from the different types of scorpions, there were also snakes, spiders, and lizards, just to name a few. It was becoming more likely that I would find this family dead from stupidity. I followed the barefoot tracks, and they seemed to lead around the corner of the camper. In fact, they did several laps around the camper, with frequent stops where the feet were pointed toward the camper as if looking inside. That's when it hit me like a ton of bricks. This family had been stalked. I stepped in a wider circle so I wouldn't disturb the footprints. It became more apparent by the minute that this was a crime scene. I pulled out my radio to call in my position and request backup or police. But my radio was strangely silent. It didn't even click when I released the talk button. The light was lit, so I knew the battery was charged, it just wasn't transmitting. The smart thing to do just then would have been to get in my truck and drive to the station to report what was happening. I took one step toward the truck. That's when I heard the scream. It was a woman's scream, high and piercing. It was a scream of pain and anguish, as if her whole world had come crashing down. My fight or flight kicked in, and there wasn't an ounce of flight in it. In a heartbeat, my gun was in my hand. I turned toward the town and began following the footprints. Once they were done circling the camper, they headed straight into town. Dusk had faded and taken the light with it. I pulled my flashlight off my belt and used it to guide me on my trail. There were a half dozen buildings all in some level of decay. I was worried about stepping into one and it just collapsing on top of me. That aside from the chance of meeting a scorpion or some other creature that didn't appreciate being disturbed in their territory, the wind had died down and the air was still. It was so quiet, I could hear my own footsteps. There was something else too. I felt a vibration in the air. At the time I thought it was just my heightened senses at the prospect of meeting up with a dangerous person who may have harmed that family. Even though everything within me was demanding, I run towards the scream I'd heard. My steps were slow and measured. I needed more input. I needed to know how many people I was dealing with. 
I needed to identify threats and if I would be able to deal with this without becoming a victim myself. As I approached the first building, I had a strong feeling of being watched. Stepping on the porch made the boards creak threateningly. I didn't want this to end with a broken ankle or worse. I tested the boards before putting full weight on them and slowly approached the broken windows. I shone my light inside. I panned around slowly, finding a bunch of old boxes and general junk with the odd wooden chair and table. I was about to move on when back in the far corner, I saw a pair of eyes lit by my flashlight. I froze, my light locked on it. The eyes seemed to be locked on the light as well. I couldn't tell what it was, but it scared the hell out of me. I suddenly thought of the movie I'd recently seen, Jurassic Park. When the actor was explaining how raptors attack, how one will draw your attention while two more sneak up on you and attack from the side, I suddenly felt very vulnerable, as if someone was sneaking up behind me. I whipped around, pointing with my gun and flashlight, my eyes darting all around. But I couldn't see anything. I shone my light back inside, but the eyes were gone. This didn't comfort me in fact, it did the opposite, I was in a panic. I felt like I was surrounded, and they were just toying with me. I didn't even know who they were. I took a few deep breaths to get myself under control. I knew panic led to bad decisions, and I couldn't afford any bad decisions out here on my own. I shone my light back toward the camper and saw a shadow dart out of the light. I knew it was all or nothing. There was no backing out. I was being hunted, just like that family had been. I didn't know what was hunting me, but it didn't matter. Whoever or whatever, it was dangerous. Focus, I told myself. Stay on your toes, remember your training. Even though my training also said don't get yourself in a bad situation, it was already too late for that. Something was near the camper. I still had no idea if this family was dead or alive. The only things I had to go on were mysterious footprints and a scream. It was the stuff of every horror movie ever made. I just hoped I didn't end up as one of the victims that died a horrible gory death to save some stupid teenagers who risked their own lives by blundering into something they should have left alone. I sighed, turned my light back to the ground, and followed the footprints. I noticed for the first time there were other marks among the footprints. They had been walked over and obscured, but it looked like two long lines like someone was being dragged. I brought my flashlight back up just in time to see a set of eyes disappear behind a building on the other side of the street. I stepped up to the next building and shone my light inside to find much the same as the first, minus the eyes. I didn't linger long before turning my light back out to the streets and the other buildings. I felt like it somehow kept them at bay, as if they would work their way closer to me if I didn't sign my light their way. I didn't know how long this would last. I continued to the next building with a larger building looming larger at the end of the street. It looked like it was an old church. There was the rough shape of a steeple that had partially collapsed. I turned and flashed my light back to the street to keep the hunters back. When I stepped up to the window of the next building and shone my light inside, I found bones. Piles of bones. Most looked like they were from smaller animals, but there were larger ones interspersed with them. I was sure I spotted a couple of human femurs. I tried my radio again, but it still wasn't working. The vibration in the air was getting stronger. It was oppressive like the pressure you feel when you're underwater. The stillness in the air magnified any sound. I could hear the footsteps of someone behind me. But when I turned, I couldn't see anyone. I left the bone storage building and headed for the last building at the end of the street, the church. I walked up to the doors, and they were very plain. Two wooden doors, no gothic architecture, no cross, just a couple of wooden doors that looked like they were about to fall off their hinges. I hesitated, turned, and looked back down the street. I knew they were there, but couldn't see them. This was where they'd been hurting me all along. I held my gun and flashlight at the ready, knowing I was in for a fight as soon as the doors opened. I took a deep, cleansing breath then shoved the doors open. I shone my light all around, my eyes darting to all the dark corners. Except they weren't dark. There were candles lit all around. It was quite beautiful. It was also quite empty. There was no one there. Even empty and well lit, it gave off a creepy vibe. Why do empty churches always do that? 
You would think it would be the opposite. My senses went on high alert. I didn't trust it. It must be a trap. As I continued to scan back and forth, looking for any hiding spots among the pews, I noticed there was one person there. In the first pew, bent over so I could barely see them. I slowly made my way forward, head on a swivel as I approached the lone figure. When I was nearly there it looked like they were barely breathing. I came around in front of the creature and aimed my gun. She looked up at me. She was naked and her hands and mouth were bound. As soon as she saw me, she started screaming into the gag in her mouth. She was screaming so hard her face turned red. I reached down and slid the gag off her mouth. It's a trap, she screamed. I looked up and saw my worst nightmare. There were creatures, dozens of them. Each one looked vaguely human, but they were deformed. There was one that had one healthy arm and a second that was shriveled up. One had only a single leg, but still managed to hop toward me. Another had no legs, but used its arms to crawl on the floor. None of them had a full set of teeth, but they all had a look of hunger and rage in their eyes. They came from everywhere. Some even crawled their way down from hiding places in the ceiling, like some horrific Spider-Man. They swarmed toward the front of the church. I looked around for anywhere to go, anywhere to hide, when I locked eyes on a door that looked like it was a closet. Come on, I said grabbing her arm and dragging her over to the door. No, I can't, please don't make me, she said tugging against me. We go in here or we die, I said, cutting the ropes around her wrists and putting my jacket over her shoulders. She reluctantly came along with me as the horde of creatures was nearly on us. Quick, I said opening the door and shoving her through. I slammed it shut behind me, taking out my knife and jamming it into the wooden doorframe to keep it shut. I turned and nearly ran her over. She hadn't moved. She was standing there staring into the dark. I shone my flashlight in front of us and saw a rickety staircase descending into the darkness. P please don't make me go down there, she whimpered. We don't have a choice, I said. They'll be through this door soon. The pounding had gotten louder. She turned toward the door, then pulled my jacket closer around her and took a deep breath. I stepped around her and led the way shining my light all around trying to make sure we wouldn't run into any surprises. The boards creaked menacingly with every step I took. I couldn't see what was underneath, but had no desire to find out the fast way. I looked back and she was still staring down. I held my hand out and she slowly took one step then another. Her bare feet were filthy. I wondered if she was getting splinters as she took each step slowly and gingerly as if walking on hot coals. After she had taken a few steps, I turned back to guide our way. The stairway was long and attached to an uneven stone wall. At some points, it jutted out far enough I had to squeeze around to get to the next step. It was getting colder as we descended. I started missing my jacket, but knew she needed it more. The spiderwebs weren't helping my anxiety either. I wondered if they were made by the deadly breed. I glanced back and saw she was still working her way down the stairs. When I looked forward again, there was a creature coming up the stairs toward me. I didn't think, just reacted. I barely had the gun pointed until I fired. The creature fell back with shock frozen on its face and tumbled down the stairs. I instantly regretted my action as my ears were already ringing from the gunshot in such an enclosed place. I turned around to check on her, but she was curled up in the fetal position, sitting on a step, ears covered, rocking back and forth. It's okay, I tried to say, but my voice sounded strange. I guess temporary deafness will do that. At least I hoped it was temporary. She didn't look at me. I was unsure if she had heard me so I touched her shoulder, and she immediately recoiled and climbed several stairs backing away. I bent down to her. Look, I know you're scared, I would be too, but if we're going to get out of this, we have to do it together. If I'm going to have to check on you every few steps, will be helpless if another one of those things attacks. I D don't want to go D down there, she stammered. I looked ahead and then back at her. We have no choice. I turned and started down the stairs again. After around a dozen steps, I turned to see she had stood and was slowly making her way down again. I kept going until I made it to the bottom and kicked the corpse of the creature out of our way. I looked around but there wasn't much to see. 
It was a passageway made of the same rough cut rock walls and a dirt floor. I turned to see her make it to the last step. Her eyes were wide with fear. I could only imagine what she had already been through. She looked away as she stepped past the corpse. I decided to make a little conversation as we walked down the endless passageway to get her to focus on something other than our situation. You're from the camper, aren't you? I said. She nodded absently as she stared at the floor. Were you going on vacation? Another nod. I saw the kids' toothbrushes on the bathroom sink. How many kids do you have? Her eyes glazed over. Two. Boys. And your husband is with you. She nodded. Where were you headed? Vegas. What made you stop here? The kids wanted to see the abandoned town. Tears streamed down her dirty cheeks making lines on her face. Would you like me to stop talking? She nodded. We continued forward in silence. The chill of the place made me shiver, but not just because of the temperature. The thought of being attacked at any moment was more than keeping me on my toes, it was wearing on my nerves. After some distance, we came to an opening that stretched out into a full room. She stopped and stared. I was puzzled at first until I noticed the smell. It was the stench of death. I shone my light around the room. The first corner I came to held a pile of bones. There was no denying these ones were human. They were large and the right shape. There were even a couple of full torsos still together that hadn't deteriorated yet. In the next corner, there were three bodies hanging from the dirt ceiling. It looked like a man and two boys. They had been strung up by their arms and were covered in blood. There were innumerable cuts and puncture wounds, but the most horrid sight were the many bites that were taken out of them. She collapsed and began to sob. I knew right away this was her family. I'm so sorry, I said. She looked at me with a mix of hopelessness and rage. I tried to tell you not to come down here, she said with quiet forcefulness. I'm sure we can find some way to. She shook her head violently. You don't understand, she said looking me straight in the eyes for the first time. This is the trap. She stood up straight for the first time since I'd seen her in the church, took off my jacket, and tossed it behind her. She was beautiful, even though she was covered in filth. My children need food, she said stretching out her arm. In an instant two deformed creatures appeared and stood beside her. She stroked the thinning hair on their heads as they cooed at her. So, there was no woman in the camper, I said, trying to stall for time until I could come up with a plan. Oh no, there was a woman. She was taken to the birthing house. She will give my children their own children. Against her will, of course. She looked at me with disdain. She is a tool we will use to survive, just like my ancestors were treated as tools to be used in the mines. I glanced around the room and saw several more creatures emerge from the shadows and advance slowly toward me. I knew I was trapped. My mind scrambled for some plan, any plan to escape the horrors that waited for me. I glanced at the three bloody mangled bodies dangling from the ceiling and knew that would be my fate. I made my decision and didn't hesitate to implement it. In a flash, I drew my pistol and shot her in the forehead. The sound was still echoing when I started to run back to the passageway I had come from. I hoped that the shock of seeing their mother die would give me a head start before the horde of creatures hunted me down and tore me to shreds. Time seemed to move in slow motion. I felt like I was running underwater every move, every step seemed incredibly slow. I knew they would catch me, there was no doubt in my mind, it was only a matter of time. The only thing that kept me from giving up was the sheer will to live. I swung the flashlight as I ran, making shadows jump and fly around. I arrived at the bottom of the stairs much sooner than I thought possible and threw myself up them two at a time, praying that I didn't trip. The horde was hot on my heels. I could hear them getting closer. The grunts and snarls spurred me on even faster. I felt something brush against my heel and knew I had to act. I didn't bother to look back, I fired two shots into the closest one. I heard the inhuman scream and the sound of falling bodies. I risked a glance back to see them all tumbling down the stairs. I breathed a sigh of relief as I reached the door and struggled to pry my knife out of the wood. After a few agonizingly long seconds, it came free, and I dove through the door. Much to my surprise and relief, the church was empty. 
They must have all gone another way to trap me below. I looked over at the dozens of glowing candles and ran straight toward them, knocking over as many as I could. I ran to the far wall and did the same on my way out the door. Once I was through, I turned back and jammed my knife into the doors so they wouldn't open. I didn't waste time celebrating my close escape. I ran down the middle of the street so I would have a good view of anyone or anything chasing me. It didn't take long until I heard footsteps behind. They sounded more like a pack of dogs chasing me. I glanced back and sure enough, there were a half dozen deformed creatures in hot pursuit against the backdrop of the church engulfed in flame. I took some solace in the fact that at least some of the unnatural bastards must have burned up in the blaze. I had a stitch in my side and my leg muscles burned, but I didn't dare slow down. Even at the speed I was running, they were catching up. I wasn't sure if I would make it to the truck before they got me. It was going to be close. I reached the truck and breathed a sigh of relief that I hadn't locked it. By the time I got the keys and the ignition and started it, they were on me. I locked the doors and slammed it into reverse as the first body flew into my windshield, shattering it. I got some momentum going as another landed on my hood and another grabbed my door handle. I swung the truck around and slammed on the brakes, sending them flying. I threw it in drive and stomped on the gas, spraying gravel. I hadn't gone more than a few yards when another freak landed in the truck bed and started pounding on the cab roof. I could see the dents getting deeper. It would be through soon. Suddenly the pounding stopped. I kept my eye on the road but turned to see what was happening. It smashed through my rear window, grabbing me by the neck. I swerved to try to break its grip, to no avail. I could feel myself starting to black out. I knew that would be a death sentence. I pointed my gun out the window, but the creature grabbed it before I could aim at its head. My mind raced faster than the truck that was hurtling down the dirt road at breakneck speeds. I was seeing stars. I knew it was a matter of minutes until the end if not seconds. I squeezed the trigger. The gun went off right beside its head, missing it by a few inches. I was done. It howled in pain and fear at the sound and the heat of the round going off. Amazingly, it let go of the gun. I aimed at its head and squeezed the trigger again. Blood rained on me as its head snapped back and it fell into the bed of the truck with a heavy thump. I sat the gun on the seat beside me as I breathed huge gulps of air wiping the blood out of my eyes. My vision returned just in time for the turn onto the main road. The tires screeched as they bit into the asphalt on the way to the ranger station. I got there shortly after sunrise, pulled into a parking space, and sat back in the seat. Exhaustion and adrenaline crash sapped my energy. I fell asleep. I woke to the sound of someone knocking on my window. I whipped around, grabbed the gun off the seat, and swung it back around at the window. Whoa there, son, the older ranger said, raising his hands. What's got your panties in a bunch? I took a deep breath, lowered the gun and the window, then told him the whole story. The longer I went the more serious he became. Until the story was done, his face was made of granite. He stuck his hand in the window. Keys, he said. I pulled the keys out of the ignition and handed them to him. Go inside and get yourself cleaned up, he said. I'll take care of this. I stepped out of the truck on shaky legs and walked into the ranger station, threw away my bloody uniform, and took a long shower. By the time I had finished and changed into a fresh uniform, the other ranger was back. He stepped inside the station and scanned the room until he found me. All taken care of, he said with a crooked smile. What do you mean, I said. Did you call the police? He looked around at the handful of rangers that were milling around the room trying to make it look like they weren't listening to our conversation. Yeah, we're not going to get the police involved in this, he said. What? Why not? He looked at me with an odd determination in his eyes. So you really killed her, did ya? He said. Of course, it was her or me. Most of the folks around here give that place a wide berth, he said. There's signs all over saying no trespassing in danger. You'd think it was almost natural selection for those who ignore all the warnings. But those travelers. And then there are others who visit the place on the down low, all quiet like, he said as if I hadn't said anything. Those folks might say you robbed them of their fun. You might even call them conjugal visits. 
There might even be some of those folks in this very room. I stared at him in disbelief, then looked around the room and saw every set of eyes focused on me. There wasn't a smile or even a hint of one that suggested this was a joke. He clapped his hand on my shoulder. Why don't you head home and rest today, he said. You've had a long night, we'll take care of things. He ushered me toward the door, pausing before opening it. Just remember that nothing happened, he said. Because if the police get an anonymous phone call, we might have to drive out and grab a couple of children to come visit your house in the middle of the night. You get me? I nodded my head in a daze as he opened the door. That's the story I tell when people don't take the hint and stay away from the town. It's been years, and every once in a while, I hear of travelers that disappeared in the area. I shake my head and wonder. I was out walking around the bush hunting for upland birds. I walked through a bit of a valley to as a shortcut to get to another area, when I came across a guy standing on the trail with an R-15 at the ready position. Instantly the hairs on the back of my neck stood up instinctively knowing this wasn't a place I wanted to be. Trying my best to stay calm. Hey, just out bird hunting, how are you doing? Fine. Long pause. I'm hunting deer. Deer season wasn't open, Arkansas 15s are not legal for deer, and he wasn't dressed for deer hunting. As a matter of fact, he looked homeless, hadn't changed his clothes or bathed or shaved in several days obviously, and looked emancipated. Think of the scariest 50-year-old meth addict you can think of, and put an R15 in his hands and you're probably close. Do you know the best way for me to go to find some birds? Well, I imagine you might find some back the way you came. His voice got noticeably sharper with the back the way you came, and I obviously took the hint. I don't know if there was a meth lab or what just down the trail, but I was certainly happy to leave. I reported the incident to the sheriff the next day, but I don't know that anything ever came of it. Not hunting, but hiking through the Appalachian Mountains after a fresh snow with a friend who owned the land. We come around a bend in a hauler and my friend stops dead in his tracks. I look up and around 40 yard up the hill looked like a mound of pitch black coal. But coal doesn't have yellow eyes. Coal doesn't have ears that fold back and tail that begins to twitch. We both start slowly backing away, keeping our eyes fixed on Black Panther. One of us lead the way back down the trail while the other walked backwards to keep watch, switching places every so often. The next morning, we went outside my friend's house and there were cat prints larger than my fist in the snow all around his house. We had been followed back. I've been told my whole life that there are no such animals in those mountains, by all sorts of environmental specialists and scientists, but we both saw it and my friend's entire family saw the tracks the next morning. Wasn't quite bad enough to keep me out of the woods, but definitely sent me home the day it happened. Several years ago, I was deer hunting in a very remote section of a national forest in northern Wisconsin and had a very weird experience that spooked me pretty good. I was hunting from a ladder stand about 20 feet off the ground. It was late morning on a cloudy, dead calm, no wind day. All of a sudden I heard what sounded like a whooshing sound right over my head. It startled me because I didn't see anything to go along with the whooshing sound. The only way I can describe it is that it was the sound you would expect to hear if a large bird like eagle or hawk sized flew 5-10 feet over your head. Not wings flapping, but just, just like a whooshing or swooping sound. It was weird because I've spent a lot of time in the woods over many years to know that large birds don't often fly close to people much less right over your head, unless it's like a seagull at the beach or something. Big birds in the woods sure as hell don't fly toward humans often at least not in my experience. Anyway, at this point I just assumed that the sound must have been a bird of some type, and I must have just looked up too late to see it. Whatever. Back to deer hunting. Then about 10 minutes later it happened again. But this time I actually saw a shadow on the ground moving towards me before I heard the sound. The shadow was somewhat faint, but it definitely looked like the shadow of a bird, 
so I thought for sure I would see the bird this time. I looked up in the air above the shadow, and then just as it got to me I heard and felt the whooshing again, this time even closer than before. It actually made me flinch and duck my head, like something big had just barely missed my head from above. I didn't see anything despite wildly swinging and swiveling my head up, around and behind me to try and catch whatever just dive bombed me. So now in my head, I'm thinking there's no question that a big ass bird of some type definitely just flew at or right over my head twice. But somehow I miss seeing it both times. Thoughts racing through my mind. This thing is some kind of stealthy MF bird. Why the hell is a bird swooping on me? Am I near its nest or something and it's trying to warn me off? It's late fall or early winter. I should clarify at this point in case people don't know what a ladder stand is that I am in a wide open metal chair with an 18 feet ladder attached to it, leaning up against a tree with my back against the trunk. There are very few branches above me and only a few below me. The point is my vision wasn't obscured in any way above or below me and I'm surrounded by leafless trees. So the chances of a large bird being able to come at me and swoop on me without being seen coming or going is zero. Zero. I wasn't really scared yet at this point. Just confused as hell. I started rationalizing maybe it was an owl. I've heard they can be super quiet when they fly. Maybe he came from a different angle than the sound and shadow suggested and I just missed him. But why couldn't I even catch a backside view after it swooped past though? This was a invisible bird. The story doesn't get any different or more dramatic from here other than the same thing happened maybe four or five more times over the course of about an hour, including the shadow on the ground. Each time it comes at me from a different angle, and each time it seems to graze just barely above my head. I'm not gonna lie, I eventually started freaking out inside because the only two plausible explanations at that moment were that I was either being harassed by an actual invisible bird or I was losing my marbles alone in the woods. I was genuinely leaning toward the ladder to be honest. Packed up my gear, climbed down and headed back to camp. The next day I took my stand down and moved it about a half mile away. Never heard or saw the invisible bird again, but it stuck with me for years afterwards. Still does. A co-worker and I were on a business trip around 2007 or 2008 driving on a dark road in South Dakota. I should point out that we weren't allowed to drink on these trips, so we were stone sober. I will confess it was late at night, and it was a long day, so there is that. It was also a dark rural road lit only by the headlights in front of us. But immediately after what happened and days later, we confirmed we saw the same thing a man was on the road. All of a sudden, we actually thought we were going to run him over. He sprouted wings and flew up and over the car and out of sight. Very large hole above the toilet at a truck stop between Vegas and California. On the other side, an old massage room and ripped curtain off to the side. I was walking up a trail at a popular park in Santa Barbara. Near the entrance I started to notice small stick figures and groups of sticks in like in a shape and figure shapes hanging from very tall trees, out of reach to most. There was something in the middle, or at the top of most of them. I couldn't figure out what it was. Gum, hair, small intestine. I didn't really stay looking long enough to know. I did take pictures, but I forgot about it until now. This was many years ago. I should look in my Google Photos. One time at my grandma's house, I went out to my car about 2 a.m. to retrieve a laundry basket of clothes. I had come back from out of town earlier that night. As I stepped out of the house and onto the sidewalk leading to the car, I looked up and swear I saw a very tall thing sort of bow its head down and step backward out of sight. The best description I can give is that it looked white-ish and had the head of maybe like a wolf, pointy ears. For some reason, the word slinky comes to mind. I freaking stopped dead in my tracks and stepped two steps backward into the house. The thing I saw was nearly as tall as the corner where the eaves of the roof met. I have to think it was my eyes playing tricks on me because that made zero sense, but how could I see that from a reflection of street lights or whatevs on a stucco wall? 
The street light would have been on the other side of a very large tree, so minimal light would have come through if any. I don't know. But I could describe that thing I saw to a frickin' T if someone were to try and draw it. Skinny, white, wolfy head, standing upright. I was four-wheeler riding with my buddies on some old logging roads in Lincoln County, West Virginia that connect to the Hatfield-McCoy trails. We happened upon an old log cabin that was abandoned and sat a few yards off the trail, and we decided it would be a great spot to take a break. So we're all sitting there on our quads eating lunch and drinking a beer when I noticed this old apple tree off to the side of the cabin. I walked over and was looking it over to see if it had any apples on it. Once I got close to it, I realized that there were a bunch of mice dangling from fishing line that was tied to the branches of the tree. On closer inspection, there were probably 5,100 of them in various states of decay. They all looked smashed so they had probably been caught in a regular old mouse traps, and then someone was bringing them up there, tying little knots around their necks, and then dangling them from the tree. Weirdest shit I've ever seen. I showed my buddies, and then we hurried up and got the hell out of there. My buddy and I planned a trip to an extremely remote backcountry lake on the border of Montana and Idaho. Very remote. Two hour drive into the woods, then a 22 mile shady dirt logging road, 12 mike hike the last three straight bushwhacking. Most difficult hike of my life. What an amazing lake in four days. On the way back, there is this section during the bushwhack where it opens up a little and follows a creek. Quite a larger creek, almost a river. We mentioned on the way in that there looked like a few good fishing spots. Anyway, we got to that section on the way out and took a cliff bar and caffeine break. Took our packs off and 20 feet away on a log, there was a very old man. I mean old. I'm 45 and know what 80 years old looks like. This guy had to be 95 plus. Scared the shit out of us to even see another person. He had very dark eyes and a strange smile. He asked us where we were going and how long we'd been out. Honestly, he seemed to be vibrating, if that makes sense. The thing is, there is absolutely zero possible way the old man could get there. Impossible. Mountains on all three sides, no places to camp or even set up a tent. There were no other cars at the trailhead. I can't stress enough how impossible it would be for the frail old man to be there. This was 2018. I spent most of my life running around the woods of Southern Oregon, and I've seen some weird stuff out there. First story. Way out in the middle of nowhere, far from any road, my friend and I stumbled across a large fenced-in area. 10 feet chain link. Inside the fence were all these trees planted in perfectly straight rows. No biggie, the Forest Service does sciency stuff out in the woods sometimes. What was odd is that every single tree was bent in a specific shape. All of them were crooked in the exact same way. We didn't climb the fence that day because our dogs were acting super sketchy and one ran off. We found him eventually, thank goodness and despite looking, I've never found that place again. Back then, I was convinced it was a nefarious government project a la Stranger Things or Aliens lol. The vibe was really weird there in our defense. Now that I think about it, maybe someone was growing trees in that shape to make a boat. I read that people do this. The woods can be spooky sometimes so maybe it was aliens or Bigfoot, hee <laughs> hee. Another time with that same friend, we were again out in the literal middle of nowhere, dry camping and hiking with the dogs. We found a small clearing that had a twin-sized rusty old iron bed frame, a small rusted out cook stove and some other rusty buckets and stuff. The odd part is that it was so far from anything, even old logging spur roads. Whoever lived out there really didn't want to be found or bothered. Can't blame them, really. Near Diamond Lake, right on Rough Creek where it converges with Fish Creek, near the breathtaking Tokti Falls, I embarked on a deer hunting adventure with my teenage son. Upon reaching our campsite, 
a realization struck us we had forgotten our tent poles. Undeterred, after hiking around and having dinner, we resigned ourselves to sleeping on the ground. In deference to the dry conditions, we refrained from lighting a campfire. As the night unfolded, I drifted into a deep sleep, oblivious to the tranquility around us. However, my slumber was abruptly disrupted by a peculiar sensation on my beard. At the time, I sported a voluminous beard and mustache, coupled with long hair. It felt as if something were gently running fingers through my facial hair, not with the intention of waking me, but as though attempting to ascertain my identity. I likened it to a blind person delicately exploring the contours of a face to see through touch. Oddly, my first thoughts turned to a squirrel or another critter. Amidst this curious interaction, an unmistakable and overwhelming odor engulfed the air, a pungent mixture of burnt hair and decomposing meat. The intensity of the scent heightened my senses. With a sudden jolt, I sat up and roared, hoping to startle whatever unseen presence was exploring my facial hair. In response, it swiftly retreated into the thick underbrush, avoiding any need to cross the nearby dirt and gravel paths. The reverberations of its departure were unmistakable crashing through the foliage on two legs, emitting a distinct impression of size and weight. Once I regained my bearings, I reached for a flashlight, eager to investigate the ground for any trace of tracks left by this mysterious visitor. Much to my surprise, there were none to be found. This encounter, unlike typical Bigfoot sightings, did not unfold through visual cues. Instead, it was experienced through scent, touch, and sound. Reflecting on this uncanny episode and exchanging stories with others who have ventured into the woods, I am increasingly convinced that I had a close encounter with a Bigfoot that memorable evening. Additionally, it's worth noting that the area through which the Bigfoot made its hasty escape was blanketed in dry leaves, amplifying the noise as it navigated through the underbrush. The unmistakable crunch of leaves underscored the creature's departure, leaving an indelible mark on the memory of that eerie night in the Oregon wilderness. My name is Kale, and this is a story about the first time that I saw a werewolf. It happened when I was a little boy, around 8 to 11 years old. I lived in Estonia, and I still do, with my stepfather, mother, older sister, younger brother, and our dog. We had gone to our summer home, a beautiful old house that my parents had bought. We had added new windows to it because it didn't have any. One night, my sister and I decided to sleep in a tent. So our stepfather set it up, and we spent the night in there. I was a little nervous because I had heard that the forest near our house had bears. Still, my mother assured me that bears don't come close to humans, and well, she was right. What I saw wasn't a bear. Around midnight, when my sister was sleeping, I had to go to the bathroom. So I got out and walked pretty far from the house to do my business. When I finished, I heard a howl and screeching. I looked around but didn't see anything. I thought it was in my head because I really liked werewolves and wolves, but there were no wolves in our forest, not that I would know. But I had asked my mother. I just felt like something or someone was staring at me, watching me. I started to walk back to the tent when I heard a scream that still haunts me. It was a scream of a deer, but it sounded like it was drowning. A few minutes later, I heard rustling in the bushes. I looked toward the big bush near me, roughly 50 feet away, and saw an animal with red-yellow glowing eyes looking directly at me. I thought it might be a neighbor's dog, but they lived a few miles away, and the dog wasn't as big as this creature. So I was startled because my second thought was a bear, and I didn't move because I knew when you meet a wild animal, you can't turn your back to it. So you have to walk away slowly backward. But when I tried, I wounded my foot and that thing growled loudly, preventing me from walking away. I was afraid, knowing that it wasn't a bear. Bears don't growl like that. I stood there, this thing staring at me, and I started to smell a rotten stink mixed with blood. It growled again with even more intensity. A few minutes, which felt like hours, had gone by when something happened that I could only dream of. The thing stood on its back legs, and I saw what it looked like. Like I said, I was a big fan of werewolves, but didn't think I would meet one. It was about eight to eight and a half feet tall with red yellowish eyes covered in fur. Its upper body had longer fur than the lower part, 
and it looked like a man but was bigger and had a tail and a wolf or German shepherd's head. The thing stared at me for more minutes and came closer. It had black claws and brown fur and sniffed me really close, about five feet away, and then stopped. It showed me its teeth by opening its mouth, and then I saw how its teeth were covered in blood. I think it sensed how scared I was because I was crying. Then it turned around and walked toward the forest. But before it went in, it turned around and looked at me, as if seeing if I was still watching. It held its gaze and ran into the forest. When it was gone, I finally got my body to move, and I walked to my tent with my heart pounding in my chest. I finally got in, and I could feel the tears running down my face. I kept thinking about it and couldn't believe what I saw. I tried to fall asleep, and when I woke up in the morning, I wasn't sure if it was real or if I just had an intense dream. It felt so real, and at night, there was a full moon. When I checked my foot, I saw a wound that I got last night, and I believed it was real. I haven't told anyone the story yet because I don't like it when people say that I make stuff up, like with my other stories. But I saw it for real. Now that I'm older and watching videos of true werewolf encounters, I believe I really did see a werewolf. I haven't seen any more of them of course, but who knows. I have seen a kind of unknown winged creature in Loma Linda, California. I only saw it one time and was using a pair of binoculars at night when I noticed the silhouette of what at first appeared to me as an airplane drone. It swooped upwards and had a very large wingspan that was closer to a flying wing configuration. It swung back over and headed in my direction. At the time, I estimated it to be less than a quarter mile away. I kept my binoculars on this aircraft looking dark silhouette as it came in my direction, but appeared to be lined up with a main street that passes by my location about 200 feet away. At the time I was thinking I had just spotted some kind of police surveillance drone and wasn't concerned. It had reached an altitude of 150 to 200 feet during its wing over heading back towards me and was in a descent that had reached my level of about 15 feet when passed by but was following the street. It was traveling at least 50 miles per hour and didn't have a discernible sound from a propeller. As it went past, I was startled by the noticeable red glow of its eye. The silhouette as it passed by appeared bird-like. It looked like a black eagle or hawk, but at least eight or more feet in body length and a wingspan of at least 12 feet. It passed behind some trees as I followed it and expected to see it come into view while silhouetted against the large illuminated hospital structures. To this day, I can still visualize that glowing red eye that seemed to be looking at me like it knew I was watching it. This happened around 2014. I rationalized it as being some kind of aircraft, but that silhouette resembled a bird and the glowing red eye. It wasn't right. I am not making this up and would like to know if anyone else in my area has seen something like I described. I was out at my grandparents' house, hunting coyotes as usual, this time of year. I was hiking through my next door neighbor's land to get to the wood-covered land in the back. While I was hiking, I got the feeling I was being followed by something to my right. I stopped and switched the red tint on my headlamp to my spotlight, but didn't see anything. Then I switched back to my headlamp and pulled my rifle back up and continued my hike. It was 6.15 am and the sun was just coming up. I was sitting in a hide I'd made the day before. That's when I saw something behind a group of trees on my left. It was crouched. I raised my rifle, looked through my scope and froze when I saw the creature staring back at me. I panicked and fired a shot off. That's when it stood up and took off deeper into the woods. I sat there probably another 25 minutes before I decided it was safe to head in and did so. Later that day, I grabbed my grandfather and we both went out to where I had seen the creature when it stood up on two legs and took off. We measured where I had seen it, and it was roughly seven half feet tall. To this day, I'm terrified to go out at night or in the early morning hours. In January 2005, I traveled to Elqui Valley, 
chili with my girlfriend, and we ended up in the last city, Alcahuas, where we set up our tent to relax for a couple of days. The place was deserted except for the camping owner, which was fine for me, but my girlfriend felt scared at night for no apparent reason. After two or three days, we decided to pack up and head back to the city. We went to talk to the manager about how to take the bus, and he offered to take us since the bus schedule was at 5 a.m. The next day, we woke up at 7 a.m., had breakfast, and started packing our things. Since the morning was cold, I put on a shirt and a soft shell, and my sunglasses were hanging on the shirt. After closing the soft shell, we walked to the manager's office, and while waiting, I took off my soft shell and realized my sunglasses were missing. We searched everywhere but couldn't find them. After nearly an hour, we gave up and decided to move on. About a month later, I had a vivid dream where I reenacted picking up the backpack, but in the dream, we weren't alone. A tall guy, nearly six feet, with white skin, blonde hair, and wearing gray clothes, appeared and offered me his hand. I was so scared that I woke up and told my girlfriend about the dream, and she was also scared. We never talked about this experience again, but it bugs me to this day. I've always loved hunting, and it's been a part of my life since I was 12 years old. My dad and I had an archery lease in the Texas Hill Country, and we'd spend countless hours scouting the land and tracking game. It was always a thrilling experience, being out there in nature, surrounded by the sounds and smells of the wild. But even with all my experience, there were times when I'd see things in the dark that would give me the creeps. Walking to and from my stand, which was about 1.5 miles from our camp, I'd hear strange noises and feel the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. But as time went on, I guess I got comfortable enough to not use a flashlight anymore. I mean, who needs one when it's a full moon, right? One night, as I was making my way back to camp, I nearly stepped on what I thought was a cow pie in the middle of the road. But as I was about to step over it, I noticed it was moving. At first, I thought it might have been some sort of rodent, but as I got closer, I realized it was a coiled-up western diamondback. The rattling sound it made was deafening, and it was clear that I had come way too close for comfort. I froze in my tracks, unsure of what to do next. The snake was clearly agitated, and I knew that any sudden movement on my part could set it off. I slowly backed away, trying to make as little noise as possible, but the snake continued to rattle and coil itself up. It was a tense moment, and I couldn't help but feel a sense of fear creeping up inside of me. After what felt like an eternity, I finally managed to get far enough away from the snake to make a run for it. I sprinted the rest of the way back to camp, my heart pounding in my chest. My dad was waiting for me, and he could tell something was wrong. I told him about the encounter with the snake, and he shook his head in disbelief. We both knew that it could have been a lot worse. If I had stepped on the snake, it could have easily bitten me, and with no medical help around for miles, I could have been in serious trouble. It was a wake-up call for me, a reminder that even though I was experienced in the ways of the wild, there were still dangers out there that I needed to be wary of. From that day on, I made sure to always carry a flashlight with me, even on full moon nights. I learned that sometimes it's better to err on the side of caution, and that being prepared for anything is key when you're out in the wilderness. But despite the dangers, I knew that I couldn't give up hunting. It was too much a part of who I was, and I loved the thrill of the chase too much to ever give it up. I was bow hunting and had parked myself between two deer trails, each running alongside a clear cut. I was dead center with 25 yards between me and each trail. I faced west into the wind at about dusk. There was usually a lot of deer in the area, but on that evening it seemed very quiet. Just as it became too dark to see my aiming sights, I heard crunching footsteps coming from directly behind me. At the time I thought it might be a buck in rut. The animal seemed to be following my scent directly to where I was hidden in some blackberry bushes. A cover scent had been applied to my clothes and boots using pine needles that were blended with water. 
My clothes were soaked in the solution and dried very effective. For deer anyway. This animal walked right up to the clearing behind me. I had plenty of time to turn around to situate myself for a clear shot. I raised my bow and it came into view 25 yards away and stopped. It seemed to know exactly where I was sitting. We were staring at each other from a distance of about 75 feet for about a full minute. The Bigfoot slowly swayed back and forth a few inches from side to side. I estimated it to be about seven half tall and maybe 600 pounds plus. I never pulled back on the bow and the Bigfoot eventually just turned around and walked in the same direction it came from. Because of the thick leaves on the ground, no tracks were found the next day when I returned to look around. This animal was black in color and its shoulders were approximately four feet wide. Since this incident happened, I've brought up this subject with many people in this area and I am surprised at how many have had, or know someone who has had, experiences in this county. If you're ever in the area look me up, and we can take a trip into the Cascades here behind my home. Not 100% on the story and running off of very little information, but here it goes. Friend has been seeing, hearing things lately. She lives in an older apartment building, and the other day she thought her dog was sitting in the kennel. Her dog then walked up beside her in the kitchen, so she quickly glanced over and saw a small, humanoid, black creature crouching in her dog's cage. Best way to describe it without showing it is sitting as a bullfrog would. Leading up to this, she has been seeing things out of her peripherals. Small black figures moving away from her field of vision. This happened quite a few times. The other day she had a seizure in the middle of a store. Ever since then the sightings have gotten worse. She was at work the other day and caught a glimpse of the same creature crouching outside her building. She looked away to set something down and turned back to get a better look. When she saw it again it was standing there looking at her. She said it was approximately five six feet tall standing. Leaving work she felt like she was being followed. She looked behind her and saw this creature again, and it was following her. A police officer patrols the parking lot and asked if she was okay because he saw how visibly shaken she was. He never saw anyone following her. A few days later she went to use a shower. As she was getting out someone knocked on the door. She does have a roommate but her roommate knew she was using the shower for a moment. As she approached the door, the rap sped up until she grabbed the handle to open it, and it stopped. She confronted her roommate, and she acted like she had no idea what happened. That is the gist of what has been going on. She has had a few other things happen such as LED string lights ripped down and slung across the opposite side of the room, or her Virgin Mary necklace ripped off, while sleeping broken by the chain not clasps and laid out on the bed. It was laid out in a way that looked intentional. Any idea what this could be? Looked at several things, but nothing seems to fit the bill exactly. She said it was the same creature every time. She said she couldn't make out too many details about its physical characteristics, but she did say it was black, about human height, humanoid. When it crouched, it resembled a human crouching, but when it was standing, she had a hard time making out its arms and legs. Any help is appreciated. Fought your information she has seen a doctor in regards to the seizure. Trying to rule out any kind of mental disorder, disease, but would like to see if anything jumps out to y'all. My 11-year-old grandson, who is not known to lie, was at the bus stop waiting to go to school last week. I was on the phone with him, and I heard him gasp, and I asked what was wrong. I assumed a stray or someone's dog because people don't keep their dogs in check here, unfortunately. He said he saw a tall, dark figure run into the woods. Then his bus came, and he said he had to go. I questioned him when he got home, and he said the figure was abnormally tall, taller than anyone he'd ever seen. Very thin and wearing all black. He said it had no face that he could tell that the face was all black too. I asked him if he was scared, and he said it didn't scare him but more shocked him as it wasn't anything he'd ever seen before. 
I let it go at that and didn't bring it up again for fear of scaring him. Any idea what it could have been? We live in the country, so now I'm a little nervous myself. Edit. Thank you everyone for your feedback and sharing your stories. I think Shadow Figure might be the best description so far. Yes, I wish he'd thought fast enough to snap a picture, but he said it moved unusually fast and then disappeared. In the heart of the Appalachian Trails, I embarked on a solo hiking trip, seeking solitude and connection with nature. The sun began its descent, casting long shadows through the dense forest. As I ventured deeper into the wilderness, an eerie feeling of isolation started to creep upon me. Suddenly, the tranquil surroundings turned into a nightmare as my eyes fell upon an unimaginable sight. Three mysterious creatures stood before me. The largest one, around seven to eight feet tall, was covered in a light beige-colored fur. Its massive frame obscured my view of the front of its hands, the bottoms of its feet, and even its eyes. It seemed preoccupied, reaching for something about fifteen feet off the ground. To my terror, just ten feet away stood a smaller version of the creature, approximately three feet high. It resembled the larger one, covered in hair except for the front of its hands, the soles of its feet, and around its eyes. The little one was a darker beige color, with hair that reached up to four inches in length. My heart pounded in my chest as I tried to comprehend the enigmatic scene unfolding before my eyes. Fear overwhelmed me, but curiosity kept me rooted to the spot. I watched as the smaller creature bent over and picked up a stick, attempting to put it in its mouth. As I held my breath, the creature's sharp senses seemed to detect my presence. In an instant, they turned their attention towards me, and my heart sank as low growls escaped their throats. Panic surged through me, and I knew I had to escape before they got any closer. Without a moment's hesitation, I turned and ran as fast as my legs could carry me. The forest blurred around me, and I didn't dare look back. My mind raced, trying to make sense of what I had just witnessed. Were these creatures real, or had the isolation of the trails played tricks on my mind? I ran for what felt like an eternity, my fear fueling every step. Eventually, I stumbled upon a ranger station, and I rushed inside, gasping for breath and trying to compose myself. I recounted the nightmarish encounter to the ranger, but instead of sympathy or concern, he broke into mocking laughter. Bigfoot, ha, huh, he said, his tone dripping with disbelief. You hikers always come up with the craziest stories. His lack of belief only heightened my sense of unease. I knew what I had seen was real, but with no one willing to believe me, doubts crept into my mind. Was I losing my sanity, or had I truly stumbled upon something beyond the realm of human understanding? I had just finished up a long day of studying at the university library and was finally back home, ready to catch some rest. As I was getting into my bed, I heard something strange outside my house. At first, I thought it was just a group of teenagers partying down the street, but the sounds were too bizarre for that. I peered through my window and saw nothing but darkness, but the sounds continued and they seemed to be getting closer. I grabbed a flashlight and stepped outside to investigate. As I walked down the driveway, I could hear the singing, gibberish talking, and laughter more clearly. It was coming from the nearby forest, and it sounded like it was moving further away from me as I approached. I'm a wildlife major, so I know the sounds of the local animals, and this wasn't any of them. It sounded more like some kind of gathering or party, but I couldn't see anything through the thick trees. I walked deeper into the woods, the sounds getting louder and clearer with every step. It was like they were drawing me in. But the closer I got, the further away they seemed to be. It was like some kind of strange game. After what felt like hours of chasing the sounds, I realized that I had no idea where I was. The trees looked different, and the path I had taken seemed to have disappeared. Suddenly, the sounds stopped, and there was an eerie silence. I tried to turn back towards my house, but I couldn't find my way. 
I was lost in the dark, with no sense of direction. And then, I saw something moving in the distance. It was a figure, a silhouette against the trees. It was dancing, twirling around in circles, and laughing in that strange gibberish language. I called out, asking for help, but the figure just kept dancing. It was like it didn't even hear me. It was almost as if it was taunting me, playing some kind of game. I stumbled backwards, trying to get away from the strange figure, but I couldn't. It was like I was trapped in some kind of nightmare. Finally, I fell backwards and hit my head on a rock. I must have blacked out because when I woke up, I was back in my bed. I couldn't remember anything after hitting my head. But when I went through the pictures on my phone, I found several of myself sleeping inside my tent, and they were taken on the night of the strange sounds. I still have no idea what happened to me that night, but I know one thing for sure, I won't be venturing into the woods again anytime soon. I remember that night vividly, even though I was asleep in the back seat of the car. My parents had woken me up in the middle of the night, telling me that we were going to drive out to a nearby field to look at the stars. I had protested at first, wanting to stay in bed and sleep, but my parents had insisted, saying that it was a rare opportunity to see the night sky in all its glory. We drove out to the field, and my parents set up some chairs and a blanket while I dozed off in the car. I remember waking up briefly and seeing the vast expanse of the sky above me, filled with more stars than I had ever seen before. I was mesmerized for a few seconds, but quickly fell back asleep, feeling safe and secure in the warmth of the car. It wasn't until the next morning that my parents told me what had happened while I was sleeping. They said that while they were gazing up at the sky, they saw something strange. At first, they thought it was a shooting star, but as it got closer, they realized that it was something else entirely. They described it as a bright, glowing object that hovered silently in the sky for a few seconds, then suddenly shot away at incredible speed. They were both stunned and a little frightened by what they had seen, but they didn't want to wake me up and scare me too. But that wasn't the end of the strange occurrences that night. As they were getting ready to leave the field and head back to the house, the car lights suddenly turned on and the doors unlocked themselves. My parents were taken aback by this and hesitated for a few moments before coming over to check on me. To their relief, I was still sound asleep in the back seat, completely unaware of the strange events that had unfolded around me. My parents quickly got into the car and drove back to the house, where they spent the rest of the night discussing what they had seen. It wasn't until years later that I realized just how strange and inexplicable that night had been. Even now, I can't explain what my parents saw or why the car acted so strangely. But I do know one thing for sure. That night, something mysterious and otherworldly happened, and it left a lasting impression on all of us who were there to witness it. I grew up in northern Ontario, and there's a story I remember when me and my cousin were out one night on our grandparents' tobacco farm. He was practicing driving as he had just turned 16 in his parents' pickup truck. Anyways, we were on a dirt road near the woods. It was very bumpy. I was looking out the passenger when, when I felt him slam on the brakes. That's when I saw it. It looked like a deer, but was a bit larger and so skinny that you could see its ribs. It was all white, and you could see through the high beams that its eyes were a glaring red like when you take a photo of someone with flash. It stood there and just stared at the truck. My cousin tried honking his horn, but it didn't move it just kept staring at us. Eventually, he tried to reverse out of the steep dirt path without making us fall into the gully. I looked through the rear view mirror as we drove away, and it still had its eyes locked on the truck. As we got further away and up that damn hill, I heard a shriek like I've never heard before. I'm not saying it came from the deer, but it was something I can't even explain. Almost like a bull, if that makes any sense. Needless to say, we got the hell out of there, and my cousin almost wrecked his tailgate, hitting a pothole in the path. I don't know what it was. I would say an albino deer because it had antlers, 
but it was just so creepy looking. Like an albino deer with glaring red eyes, looked like it hadn't eaten in weeks and had an almost mangy posture and face. Not really scary, but creepy to me. I was looking out my bedroom window across my backyard with a backdrop of a forest. I had a rabbit cage at the border of the forest adjacent to our work shed, roughly 40 feet away. I witnessed a six-foot-tall white rabbit with a dark vest facing the door to my pet rabbit's cage. I went into shock as I was beginning to be skeptical of such things as the Easter Bunny as I was aging out of the concept. I couldn't believe my eyes. I maintained a visual of the rabbit and pinched and slapped myself so hard to try and wake myself up. The pain confirmed I was not dreaming. I rubbed my eyes. The giant rabbit was still there. I threw open the single pane window which led to the backyard facing the rabbit cage. I yelled at the rabbit, Hey, I see you. I tried to volley up into the window to leap out and run to the rabbit in my tidy whitey kid's underwear but couldn't make it up out the window. It turned, looked at me, and took a series of bounds at high speed into the forest. I called my little brother, and he arrived at the window as the giant rabbit disappeared into the Douglas firs. I woke my parents and even a neighbor. I quizzed them as to a possible Easter costume, but I knew no one could make leaps at that speed, nor have such a detailed costume, and why run for that matter. They all had a good laugh at my expense. I explored my pet rabbit's cage and surroundings, as well as the forest soon after trying to get a sense of what occurred. No tracks and no trace evidence were left behind. The memory haunts me to this day because of the absurdity of the situation. For some reason, I thought I would Google this strange experience, such as the one I had observed in my youth as it stands out in my mind to this day. Your witness's story came up in my feed and I have goosebumps as I write this. I am in disbelief and a little embarrassed, but feel compelled to tell you my story because this is beyond coincidence and indicates something bigger is going on. Currently, I am a retired police officer and forensic artist residing in central British Columbia. I have witnessed strange things in my life and career, but this childhood memory was so strange and not a hallucination. It feels like a relief to recount it, embarrassing or not. Thanks for your time. After the six-foot rabbit incident, I had a bizarre Mary Poppins song stuck in my head on repeat, and I could not shake it. It really made no sense as I was not a fan, and it was before my time. It was odd and ill-fitting for the occurrence, he added. The report referenced in the man's testimony came from Sharon, an Illinois woman who said that when she was eight or nine years old, she awoke early one Easter morning in 1961 or 1962 to see a six-foot-tall, white, bipedal rabbit wearing a black vest embroidered with multicolored glass beads hopping through her backyard. In further correspondence with investigator Tobias Wayland, the man noted some synchronicities between his and Sharon's experiences. What's very strange is the woman from her 1962 encounter had the same dog as me and Airedale Terrier and lived in a similar type of suburb and was close to the same age and circumstance, he said. Also, like the man, Sharon only submitted her report after seeing another article published by the Singular Fortean Society on a childhood sighting of the Easter Bunny. While rare, reported encounters with mythological beings associated with major holidays are not unheard of. This isn't a super scary experience or anything, but at the time I was like 10 or so it was pretty unnerving. So I was staying with my grandparents who lived pretty much in the middle of nowhere and a dude knocked on their door. He asked for directions to town, but they lived on a dead end road where the only way to get up there is to come from town, so he obviously knew where it was. They then pointed in the direction he needed to go and then he said thanks but instead of getting back into his car, he just ran off into the woods as fast as he could. They called the cops, but they never found him, so we have no clue what happened. He left his car in their driveway and never came back for it.
I grew up in a poor neighborhood in Fairbanks, Alaska. My friends and I used to play outside together quite a bit. In the summer, we'd stay up way too late. One such summer night, when I was about 16, a friend and I were bumming around the neighborhood and chatting. My friend claimed that a person could see further in the night if they lay in a prone position. I called BS, so naturally, we had to test it out. Before I continue, some context will help. We had lived in this neighborhood our whole lives. When we went to meet up to hang out, we would step outside, look down the street, and see each other coming from the other end of the street. I say this to impart to you the strong possibility that we have an accurate perception of depth, size, and walking speed in relation to the objects present in our neighborhood. So there we were two kids, lying in the middle of the road at night, yes, we were incredibly stupid. We were looking off towards my house, which has exactly one intersection and exactly one street light visible in that direction. I was pretty content that I had won our little debate when a silhouette walked in front of that street light. It was generally humanoid but seemed to be very tall and lanky. Its head seemed vaguely ovoid, but the rest of its body seemed kind of stretched out too. Its movements were fluid and lithe. I don't know how to describe it exactly, smooth motions like if walking were swimming. It appeared to be highly efficient motions in a sense. The silhouette did not appear to be wearing any clothes. The hair on my neck stood up immediately, and I realized I was holding my breath with fear. It crossed the street very quickly, emerging from a set of pines on one side and disappearing into a set of pines on the other. It seemed to cross in three glide-like steps, lasting only a moment. So, much quicker than an adult human. My friend whispered in a panicked tone, Did you see that? I said that I had, and we agreed to get the hell out of there. We ran back to his house, locked the front door, then went to his room to bolt the windows and locked his bedroom door just to be on the safe side. Naturally, I decided to crash there, but we just stayed up talking about what we saw and what it could be. I've told this story a couple times, and people always blow me off. Which is fine. I can appreciate skepticism. But the extra weird part... For anyone that bothers to believe me, is that we met someone else in our town who experienced the same thing. That same friend and I eventually wound up working for a pizza restaurant together as young adults. We were telling our assistant manager, not much older than us, that same story. He looked super spooked as we talked about it, and when he finished he said he saw it once too, when he was walking home from a high school party. Once he saw it, he turned around and went back to the party to try to find a place to crash there, unpleasant as that was. So, here I am. I mostly keep it to myself, but when people are willing to listen I share it with the general sense that if they make fun of me I'll be alright. My co-workers now are surprisingly cool with it. They don't believe me, but they bought me an X-Files mug that says, I want to believe, just to show that it's no big deal. Despite so many people telling me my brain was playing tricks on me, I still keep my ear to the ground about humanoids, ETS, supernatural phenomena, and the like. Seen a couple UFOs since then, but nothing big. This whole thing probably happened around six or seven years ago. I lived in the middle of nowhere, Ohio, and had to make my own fun growing up. I was around 16 at the time and my friends and I decided to start ghost hunting on the weekends. We've experienced small stuff here and there nothing too insane until we went to Rogue's Hollow. Rogue's Hollow was this old mining town where there was fires, disease, etc. that eventually made the town cease to exist. It's now a national or state park, I'm not sure one of the two, but any who we decide it's worth exploring. First off, this place is in the middle of absolute nowhere. I drove a 98 Chrysler Concorde in those days, and it was an absolute chore getting there. The gang shows up. There's a total of four of us. It's getting pretty late, and we notice the house lodge where the park ranger stays, so we park a bit off to avoid getting caught. Didn't work out too well. Five minutes later we are being questioned by an old guy who was the lone park ranger. 
he ended up being pretty cool and ended up telling us some of his personal experiences. He said he would we could continue on if we promised not to do any witchcraft or satanic rituals. Apparently that was a big problem he was dealing with. At this point we ventured back into the woods where the town previously was at and stuff started getting weird. We could hear what sounded like pickaxes, men working in voices in a lot of different directions. Needless to say we were getting a bit on edge. We decided to start recording on our little EVP device. We had I'll see if I can find it somewhere at upload some stuff. We were getting words like fire, death, devil, collapse. Eventually we stumbled on an old house. It definitely wasn't inhabitable and was about 50% burnt down. One of the others and myself decided to go inside of the house while the other two stayed back. As we approached the door we turned back to our friends to give the old wish us luck, and they were sheet white looking at the second story of the building. Directly above us looking out the window down at us was a man from the shoulders up and slightly transparent. He then disappeared, not leaning back into the house, just boom gone. Usain Bolt would have been proud of my sprint time leaving that place. Fast forward to the next day, and we decide to go back the next day and explore in broad daylight. We were walking two groups of two about ten yards apart one in front of the other. I was in the back too, about one hundred yards into the wood line, and all of a sudden my friend and I both get grabbed on our shoulder, simultaneously hearing a very soft but distinct hello. At the same time we turned and booked it out of there. I haven't been back since. If you guys like this, I'll post more of our ghost hunting experiences in the future. I had the most frightening encounter while fishing on a lake in northern Minnesota in a rowboat. Late one night, I saw something appear above the tree line at the end of the bay. It was cold and it had a weird shape. Then it dropped down above the water and flew directly over my head at UFO speed and stopped. Not knowing what it was, I just glanced up and saw a pure evil mass hovering above my head. I got a feeling of dread as soon as I made eye contact and thought my life was over. Several things went through my mind. That second I thought maybe I was about to be abducted, even though I'd never heard of UFOs looking like a black cloud, and that the only thing that I could do to save myself was to pray to God and I did. It hovered for about 20 seconds and then flew off exactly the same way it flew out. This was also seen by a friend from shore having a smoke out on his dock, looking for me. As soon as it left, I frantically paddled my way back to shore, looking back thinking that it could return. Words can't explain the level of terror that I had that night. It was pure evil and still haunts me to this day. Just not knowing what it was still bothers me because what I saw that night doesn't exist in our world, but it was real. My friend and I sat at the kitchen table asking each other what that was. Nothing comes to mind that's what's so troubling. This changed my life forever. I never go outdoors at night by myself anymore, worrying that it might return. After that night, I went through some of the hardest times of my life. Strings of bad luck. I ended up getting fired at work and lost my house and also had heart issues and nearly lost my life. This all happened after that night, it was like an attachment. I still look up to the sky whenever I'm out at night fearing it might return. All I know is that whatever it was, it had to have come from a different dimension because what I saw that night just doesn't exist in our world. I'd only glanced at it for a few seconds, but that was enough to know it was pure evil because when you're not a religious person, and you think the only thing that can save you at that moment is to pray to God, then you know you're scared. It looked like a black cloud moving, like it was alive. It was about 20 feet by maybe 15 feet wide. I had my two dogs with me that night, and they were so scared they were trying to hide under my legs. When this happened, they were so scared they jumped out of the boats when we got close to shore so I landed in my muck up to my knees and couldn't get to shore fast enough. When I ran up to the cabin, the door was locked so I pounded on the door until he opened it. Not knowing my friend had seen it from the dock, I came in with mud up to my knees and he didn't even notice. 
That's when I noticed his hands were trembling from fear, so I asked him what was wrong, before even telling him of my encounter. He told me what he saw from the dock. It was exactly what I had seen hovering over my head. We spent the rest of the night drinking at the table trying to make sense of what had happened, but couldn't come up with explanations. Since that night he won't ever spend any time at his cabin anymore, and you couldn't pay me enough money to ever return. I and two other guys were moving cattle from the eastern side of Bighorn National Forest, Wyoming. We got up early one morning and started working just as dawn was breaking. At one point, three of us saw this tall, thick creature standing along the forest edge watching us. One guy took three shots at it about 50 yards away with a 30 slash 30. It screamed and we heard others crashing in the bush. We got our things together quickly as I wanted to lead our horses away from the wood line to give ourselves an edge in case we got charged. We would have more time to act and our feet would be on the ground in case of an attack moving south along the edge of the forest. We could occasionally hear something moving along with us. We turned east heading for the town and found a group of hunters camped out. So I decided to make camp with them. I felt like I had to tell the guide what was up. I didn't want to bring any problems to their camp, but I felt like I didn't have much of a choice. That night we sat and listened to something a ways off just wailing for hours. Thankfully the guide had no problem helping us and most of all he was glad we told him nothing happened that night. The guy who shot at the thing quit as soon as we got back and we never heard from him again. I will say I feel if we hadn't found a hunting party we would have had a fight on our hands. That was in 1979 and I'll never forget the sounds these things make. My name is Nathan, and I am a researcher on the subject of Bigfoot sightings. Over the years, I have heard countless stories about encounters with these elusive creatures, but one story in particular has always stood out to me. It's the story of Hav Tran and his encounter with two Bigfeet in the Deschutes National Forest. I first heard about this incident through a mutual friend of Hav's, who put me in touch with him. After weeks of trying to arrange a meeting, I finally got the chance to sit down with Hav and hear his story in person. Hav was hesitant to speak at first, but as I explained my interest in the subject and my willingness to keep his identity confidential, he began to open up. He told me about how he and his wife were avid hikers and would often venture out into the wilderness to explore. On July 13, 1996, Hav and his friend Dustin were hiking up a steep slope in the Deschutes National Forest when Hav slipped and broke his leg. He passed out from the pain, but when he regained consciousness, he was face to face with two big feet. The creatures were massive, standing at seven half to eight feet tall with broad shoulders and large feet. One was a gray-white color, while the other was a sandy gray with a white ruff on its head. Have couldn't tell if they were male or female due to their hairiness, but he could see that they had small mouths and no whites in their eyes. The big feet were making noises at each other, but Half couldn't understand what they were saying. He passed out again and when he woke up, he was lying on the ground near his wife, who had been waiting for him at the trailhead. She told him that two ape men had carried him out of the forest and left him there. Hav's wife described the creatures as horribly ugly with long hair, except on their faces, heads, and feet. She was visibly shaken by the encounter, and Hav was left with a broken leg, a story that no one would believe, and a sense of unease that would stay with him for the rest of his life. As I listened to Hav's story, I couldn't help but feel a sense of awe and wonder. Here was a man who had come face to face with one of the greatest mysteries of our time, and yet he was met with skepticism and disbelief. I knew that I had to keep his story alive, to share it with others who were just as fascinated by the unknown as I was. But when I tried to contact Hav again a few months later, I found out that he had moved without leaving a forwarding address. It was as if he had disappeared, leaving behind only his incredible story and a sense of mystery that would linger for years to come. 
To this day, I continue to search for answers about Bigfoot and the many other unexplained phenomena that surround us. And while I may never know the truth about Hav's encounter, I will always be grateful for the chance to hear his incredible story and to be reminded that there is still so much we don't know about the world around us. My name is Dustin Anderson, and I have been an avid motorcycle enthusiast for as long as I can remember. One day, my friend Dustin Everenden and I were out riding when we decided to stop and take a break. We had been riding for hours, and our bodies were sore and tired. As we sat there, enjoying the stunning view of the valley below us, something caught our eye. It was a large animal, standing about six to seven feet tall, with broad shoulders and walking on two legs. At first, we thought it was just a bear or some other large animal, but as we watched it, we realized that it was something else entirely. The creature got up from where it was sitting and began to walk around on two feet. We could see it clearly now, and it was like nothing we had ever seen before. It had long, shaggy hair and massive hands that almost dragged on the ground. As we watched, the creature sat down on a nearby stump, seemingly unaware of our presence. We were both frozen in shock and fear, not knowing what to do. We knew that we should have just gotten on our bikes and left, but something about the creature's presence had us rooted to the spot. We watched it for what felt like hours, and then finally, we decided that we had to go. We didn't want to risk getting too close to the creature, as we didn't know how it would react. We got on our bikes and sped away, our hearts racing with fear and adrenaline. As we rode away, I couldn't shake the feeling that we had just witnessed something truly extraordinary. I knew that what we had seen was real, but I also knew that no one would believe us if we told them. We tried to put the incident behind us and go about our lives as usual, but the memory of the creature haunted us both. We couldn't stop thinking about it, wondering what it was and where it came from. Months went by, and we didn't see or hear anything about the creature again. But then one day, we received a strange message on our phones. It was a video of the creature we had seen, captured from a different angle. We couldn't believe it. Someone else had seen the creature too, and they had proof. We tried to investigate further, but the trail went cold. It was as if the creature had disappeared without a trace. To this day, I still think about that day on the mountain and the creature we saw. It's a memory that will stay with me forever, and one that I will never forget. What convinced me was I saw it happened and my cousin saw it with me. We were cruising through some rural areas in my cousin's car, and I want to say it was about 1 or 2 a.m. We weren't smoking or drinking, but just having a nice cruise. We went on this road that went through some heavy woods, but we did it before so we had no fear. It was dark, of course, no moon with just a slight sprinkle of rain. We were coming to this part in the woods where there was a street light, but it was an old light and was starting to dim out. There used to be an old building there, but was torn down, but the light stayed up for a few years. Mind you, this was very rural and no one lived nearby for maybe 20 miles, so it was extremely rare for you to pass another car let alone another person at this time. It didn't help that the locals said stay out of the woods at night. I was just looking out my window at the woods, and when we were coming up to the light, next thing I know, the car does a movie turn like stomp on the brakes to a 180 and freaking burned rubber the other way. I get weirded out and look back to the car, and I see the road illuminated by the street light, and I see this massive black figure beside the road, it takes one step, and it's in the middle of the road, another step, and it's already on the other side. Immediately, I look forward scared out of my mind and look at my cousin, and I see the intense fear on his face. We don't say a word to each other, and he drops me off. I stay up till sunrise and finally go to sleep. Funny now that I think about it, we never talked about once not after it happened. But yeah, we saw Bigfoot and the locals do tell very similar stories.
My father is a lorry driver in Europe, and I used to keep him company during summer time when I was still at school age. There was a one night that I remember correctly. It was like 1-2 a.m. in Latvia when I saw this guy in a black hat standing next to the road and trying to hitchhike. We missed him and I asked my father why didn't we stop to help him it was raining heavily. He said that it is not safe and we just went past him. But in like 30 minutes there was the same guy standing on the side of the road. I was like 12 back then. I told my father and he just stated that this was a coincidence and we went past him again. But in like again 40-50 minutes there was the same guy this time waving at us. I was sure it was him again, but my father said nothing and told me to go to sleep. That is one of strange things I saw during my escapades with my father. He doesn't want to talk about that one ever. I was spiked out in the Russian wilderness and woken up at about 2 a.m. by a sound that was just like a baby whimpering and crying. As the father of three, I think there's something etched in my survival instinct that's triggered by the sound of a baby crying in the night. My eyes burst open the size of saucers straining to see beyond the darkness at the horror. I knew had to be there staring at me. I laid there frozen for what seemed like minutes trying to wrap my brain around how a baby could be crying in the middle of wilderness. Mere feet from my bivy nonetheless. I picked up my headlamp and turned it on expecting this to be the last memory I'd ever have. Before the child of Satan devoured me, I scanned the slope behind my camp looking for anything that could be holding a crying baby. A deranged killer, a zombie mother, a rabid mountain lion. I remember the sound changing from a crying to almost an alien language that included little beeps and clicks. It was about two or three minutes of this not-stop madness before something below the fan of my light caught my eye. I turned my headlamp toward the ground and there, about three yards away, was what looked like an all-brown guinea pig. Now I'm really baffled, how the hell did a guinea pig get loose out here? Well it eventually ran down a burrow below a tree stump and I never saw it again. I was still camped out for another two or three days before heading home then spent the next week googling. Brown guinea pig in the wilderness. Finally the mystery was solved. It was a mountain beaver. It's easy to find a picture of one, but really hard to find the sound one makes when you're googling for guinea pigs in the wilderness. Life in the isolated ranger station had always been quiet, but as I took on the responsibility of its maintenance, the solitude became a canvas for the supernatural. My days were filled with the creaking of floorboards, distant whispers that hung in the air, and the unmistakable presence of unseen entities. The station, nestled deep within the heart of the wilderness, had long been abandoned by the park service. It stood as a relic of a bygone era, its weathered timbers echoing with memories of rangers who once called it home. When I arrived, I was eager to breathe life back into its decaying bones, unaware of the spectral inhabitants that awaited me. The strange occurrences began subtly the murmur of conversations just beyond my hearing range, soft footsteps echoing in empty corridors, and fleeting glimpses of shadowy figures darting out of sight. At first, I dismissed these incidents as products of an overactive imagination, the result of long hours spent in solitude. However, as the days wore on, the phenomena escalated, becoming impossible to ignore. One evening, as the sun dipped below the horizon, casting the ranger station into an eerie twilight, I heard the unmistakable sound of laughter echoing through the empty halls. Startled, I hurried to investigate only to find the rooms empty and the laughter fading into an unsettling silence. Determined to uncover the truth behind these unexplained events, I delved into the history of the ranger station. Dusty archives revealed the station's vibrant past, a hub of activity teeming with rangers who dedicated their lives to preserving the wilderness. However, it was a tragic event that stained the station's legacy. Decades ago, a group of rangers had perished in a devastating wildfire that swept through the area. The abandoned station had once been a bustling outpost, 
a second home for those who protected the park. The spirits of those lost in the flames seemed to linger, their presence intertwined with the very essence of the station. Haunted by the revelations, I sought to communicate with the lingering spirits, hoping to bring closure to the tragic events of the past. Armed with candles and old photographs, I embarked on a series of seances within the station's walls, attempting to bridge the gap between the living and the dead. During these sessions, the air thickened with unseen energy, and the station seemed to come alive with ethereal voices. Through whispers and faint touches, the spirits conveyed their lingering sorrow, forever tethered to the place they had once called home. It became clear that their spectral presence was not malevolent but trapped, unable to move on. As my understanding of the spirits deepened, so did my commitment to helping them find peace. I enlisted the help of paranormal investigators, experts in the supernatural who brought with them an array of instruments to measure and document the phenomena. Together, we conducted thorough investigations, capturing chilling eaves and shadowy apparitions on camera. The turning point came when I discovered an old journal hidden in the station's attic. Its yellowed pages chronicled the final moments of the rangers' lives, detailing their valiant efforts to protect the park from the relentless flames. It was as if the words themselves held the key to unlocking the spirit's torment. Armed with this newfound knowledge, we conducted a final seance, using the journal as a focal point to communicate with the lingering souls. The atmosphere crackled with energy as the spirits responded, their voices expressing gratitude and acceptance. Slowly, the ranger station seemed to sigh with relief, the weight of decades-old sorrow lifting from its time-worn beams. In the weeks that followed, the once-abandoned outpost transformed into a haven of tranquility. The mysterious footsteps and whispers ceased, replaced by an air of serenity that permeated every corner. The spirits, finally free from the shackles of the past, had found their peace, and the ranger station became a testament to the resilience of both the living and the dead. This happened in the Nature Coast area of Florida. We were hiking a few miles deep into an area called the Wikiwashi Preserve. This place used to be a mine before it filled up with water. Now it's open clearings with mounds of dirt hills here and there and thick forest and vegetation surrounding it. We hiked out for about an hour and a half, making it through the clearings and lakes to the opposite side's forest. We walked a short bit into the forest and quickly realized how dark it was getting. We turned around to head back to the car and made it a few yards back into the clearing and lakes, but we both turned around and saw something. I remember first thinking it must be a giraffe because of how tall and lanky it was. It stood on two legs and reached the height of the trees at the mouth of the forest. It was walking from left to right, halfway between us and the forest. I remember it leaning forward slightly, bending at where the pelvis would be. I don't recall much detail whether because it was dusk or so difficult to comprehend. I remember it as just black. We watched it cross the path we had just come down and head toward the right, through some tall grass on either side of the trail. It seemed so tall, definitely too tall to be a person. My brother and I looked at each other and ran all the way back to the car without a word. It was early October in 2018, and we had just moved to the area almost a year ago. It's a small house in a one-off cul-de-sac. The closest thing to civilization is a church across the street, and everything else is roads, neighborhoods, or woods. There's a healthy amount of trees in between the neighborhoods, giving a nice sense of privacy. Out of all the eight or so houses on this street, only our house had access to the woods surrounding the street. My mother was ecstatic about the house, as she always enjoyed the woods. I always got a creepy feeling from them, but figured it was just my anxiety. At the time, I was grounded due to some poor grades, which left me bored most of the time. I figured that since I had seen a ton of deer through our back window, I'd go exploring a little bit and see if there was anything interesting. The woods aren't terribly dense directly behind us, but definitely got a lot more so if you went further in. I explored a while, 
Finding a few deer bones and skulls they even had the antlers attached. I thought it was really cool. A whole car albeit missing the wheels and guts, and a lot of trash. I got an old plastic container and started collecting the things I found interesting, and kept it in the back of the old car. I did this for about a week, gathering about three skulls, a handful of bones, some glass bottles, and a few other things I can't remember at the moment. Over the weekend I didn't end up going out, as it was stormy. The following week, I want to say Wednesday, after the ground dried up, I ventured back out. I went into the car to refresh my memory on how many things I had collected, and the deer skulls and bones were gone. I was confused, and assumed some animal picked them up and trotted off with them, so I went about looking around for them, or new things to collect. As I looked around, I noticed the antlers of a deer skull deeper into the woods. I don't normally go back there, especially since it's technically part of our neighbor's property, but I figured I could just pop over and grab it. As I picked up the skull, I noticed a bone a few feet away sticking out of the leaves. I figured I might as well grab it too, so I picked it up too. As it picked it up, I quickly realized it had a bit of blood and sinew on it, which was alarming to say the least. I quickly dropped it, wiped my hands on my jeans, and walked away, leaving what I assumed to be the buzzard's meal alone. As I approached the car, skull in hand, I noticed something moving in the trees a little beyond it. I froze, assuming it's an animal, not wanting to spook whatever it is. I get scanned the area and see what I now would call a crawler, a little past the car, eyes trained on me. Near white skin, skinny to the point I swear I could see its ribs, naked, hunched over, almost full black eyes, the whole nine yards. As soon as I make eye contact with it, it runs off before I can really react. After that, I went inside and I honestly don't go into the woods back there anymore. Not to mention someone bought the extra property back there and decided to build a house there. That critter is their problem now. Recently, after seeing a string of similar encounters including this one that my father directed me to reminded me of the incident, and I figured that I would investigate it a little more. I couldn't find anything on Reddit besides someone telling me it's fake. For context, we've lived in this house since 2017, and while I've heard the odd animal noise, I haven't seen any evidence of the thing since. Along with this, I haven't gone anywhere near that old car since, let alone the woods themselves. I've only heard of the odd encounter from some of the farm folks I talk to, and from online posts from the surrounding area states. I haven't witnessed much else that would be considered super unnatural and I don't really automatically believe anything talking about supernatural things unless there's evidence, but this seems at least somewhat solid. Overall, I don't know what to think about all this. What do y'all think? I grew up living in the countryside in Scotland. My village was small and surrounded for miles with fields and farmhouses. I definitely wouldn't say it was as rural or secluded as the highlands, but there were miles and miles that just felt uninhabited. Seeing my fair share of creepy things in the woods I would frequently wander through with friends or by myself. I would regularly camp in the woods with small groups of friends and a good few times by myself. One night I got home from high school and realized I had forgot my keys and got locked out resulting in me having to wait from 5 p.m. to around midnight when my dad finished work and could stop by to let me in. I could have gone round to a friend's house but adventure was calling and I had a stash of beers in my garden at the time so figured a walk and a few beers would kill the time nicely. The initial walk was fine and I made my way out to the woods eye and circled around the village a few miles out. There were no issues aside from not wearing boots and it was a good walk, especially with beer. I was heading back about 11 p.m. and was nearing the village, maybe about a mile or so to go. At one point the route I was following back split in two. One route took me along a river and the other went to the left of the river and rose into about a 50-foot ridge. I opted for the latter to try and catch the last glimpses of the sunset. I'll admit at this point I was getting a little tired, very hungry and quite tipsy, but I definitely wasn't drunk, 
and there was absolutely no way I could be drunk enough to hallucinate. As I got to the top of the ridge, I noticed what I assumed was the last pieces of sunlight reflecting off the river through the trees. As I got further along the ridge, I noticed that the reflections were actually candles, and then noticed the candles were being carried by what I can only describe as figures in black KKK-style robes. I froze in a half-crouch looking right down at them, and the woods were silent. After a few seconds of trying to process what I'm looking at the figures stopped walking and just turned their freaking heads right at me. I stood there for probably a few seconds, but it felt like an hour. I couldn't make out any faces, just the outlines of their robes, but they definitely looked human, all various heights and weights. After this brief standoff, I just bolted along the ridge to a hedgerow and just launched myself over through it fueled by a few beers and sheer adrenaline not looking back once. I have no idea what would have happened if I opted for the other route as it would have put me right in front of the bizarre procession. I had only ever heard of one other story about cloaked figures wandering through those woods and never found out who or what it was all about. There are two churches that back onto some fields in the direction I had this encounter, and given how close they were to the village I guess they must have been locals. One of the churches is very secretive with fences surrounding their compound, CCTV, security, and the odd fact that none of the members actually reside in the village. Back in the early 90s, my dad was fishing with some buddies somewhere in Maryland, I think on his friend's small fishing boat. It was another one of their overnight trips, something he did a lot after my parents divorced. This one night, dad and another friend, there were about four of them, were on lookout for ships that might run down their little wooden boat. Dad said it was so dark you couldn't see your hand in front of your face, making it easy to spot even the smallest light source on the water. After a while, Dad noticed a big green light off in the distance. At first, he thought it was a school of bioluminescent critters, or maybe even another boat. But as it got closer, realized something was just very off about it. The light was underwater, and in a perfect circle. He's no marine biologist, but my dad knows his shit about marine life. He knows about bioluminescent critters. He used to spend a lot of time telling me about them when I was a kid. Whatever this was, it was not a school of bioluminescent critters. The light went right under the boat and stopped for a few seconds as if it was studying it, then went on its way. It lit up the entire boat with the brightest green light Dad had ever seen, so bright that he could see every detail on his friend's horrified face. He says he guessed it was around 300 feet in diameter. My dad's a big believer in alien life and government cover-ups, and I think this encounter is what really sparked his interest. He says if it wasn't an alien craft, it was probably some kind of secret government craft. The only other encounter I've ever found online like it was this one in California. A few years ago, my boyfriend at the time and I were driving home from visiting friends. It was about 3 a.m., and we were taking a long, winding road down from the eastern suburbs to his house. This road has a pretty good view over the city and surrounding suburbs and out to the sea. There was one car on the road further in front of us, and as we came into the first bend, a huge round orange light appeared above the horizon. The light was easily three times as big as the outlines of construction cranes on the shoreline, and as we continued down into the next bend, the light turned into a wavy line across the horizon and then disappeared completely. This happened within about 10 seconds and we checked to see if there were any reports of anyone seeing the same thing. There was nothing. My boyfriend and I were completely sober and both saw the exact same thing but could never find an explanation for what it was or how no one else in the city seemed to see it. To this day, I regret not following the other car to ask if they had seen it too. I was an Uber driver in San Francisco. I spent on average 10 hours in the driver's seat in a day's effort. I would make anywhere from $200-$300. I now moved to a different city. I was just starting my journey with the company. 
First day on the job, I'm super pumped to be talking to people that hailed me on the internet only to get in my car. Story goes I was on my second trip for the ride-sharing company. Due to circumstances I cannot experience explain other than my lack of experience, I received a request at a swank hotel the Ritz-Carlton. After accepting the trip request I glanced at my phone to see the time it read 20 minutes past 10 p.m. I waited for what seemed as the longest five minutes on God's green earth. After deciding to leave three dishy Indian interns knock on my window, and I let them in. The trip was amazing nobody was talking and one guy fell asleep. The trip was a long distance, 19 miles, and it was surging by 2.6 so I was about to get paid major green. Move comes to shove that wasn't the only green that I was witnessing, and I see a guy in the back seat start to whimper. He had awakened from his sleep and started pulsing all over the back seat of my car without opening the windows. Sickened from the odor, I continued to drop them off at their hotel. Needles to say I was green to my stomach with the grime and stench I had to clean up. Many rideshare drivers love what they do for their communities in support of establishing an equal price for transportation as well as driving drunk people home safely. Please don't puke in their cars. I never thought that walking home from my friend's place would turn out to be a nightmare that I would never forget. It was around 11 p.m., and the city lights were far away, and the only source of light was the dim moonlight. As I walked down the deserted street, I heard some faint footsteps behind me. At first, I didn't pay much attention, thinking it was just someone else walking home like me. But then, the footsteps grew louder and closer, and I started to feel uneasy. I started walking faster, hoping to put some distance between me and whoever was following me. However, as I picked up my pace, I heard him walking faster too. My heart started racing, and I began to panic. I didn't know what to do and kept looking over my shoulder to see who it was, but I couldn't see anyone. The road ahead seemed endless, and I didn't want to turn back and confront the stranger. So I kept walking, hoping that I would reach the city soon. But the footsteps persisted, and I knew that I wasn't alone anymore. The stranger started speaking in a low voice, but I could still hear what he was saying. He kept repeating phrases like, come here, and join us, which made me shiver. I knew that something wasn't right, and I had to do something to get away from him. My heart was pounding in my chest as I picked up my pace, hoping to lose him. But every time I did, he would catch up with me. I started to feel trapped and scared, with the thought of what could happen to me. It felt like an eternity, and it was just me, him, and the wind. Finally, after what felt like hours, I saw the city lights in the distance. I knew I had to make a run for it, so I sprinted towards the lights, hoping to get away from the stranger. As I ran, I could hear his footsteps getting farther and farther away. I finally made it to the city, and I breathed a sigh of relief. I was safe now. But as I lay in bed that night, I remembered something that made me shudder. The stranger had something in his hand, and it looked like a knife. I didn't want to imagine what could have happened if he had caught up with me. From that day on, I made sure to avoid walking alone at night and always stayed in well-lit areas. The memory of that night will always stay with me, and I hope that I never have to experience something like that again. Well, I live in southern Canada in farm country. I do believe in the paranormal within reason. Example, if it can be something logical, I believe that first. I just cannot for the life of me explain how I have this memory of this forest from when I'm a kid. I was paying in the woods with my brother, hide and seek for anyone wondering, and I was the one hiding. I remember running as far as I could through the very familiar woods, and it's as if I crossed into another dimension. I ran across an invisible line into a place I'd never seen before. All the regular forest sounds that you would normally not notice were gone. This was scary for me, the trees seemed so much bigger, so I ran back the way I came all the way till I found my brother again. He found me right away and I calmed down. 
I told him about a part of the woods I'd never seen before so we tries to find it, but never could. If you're looking for scariest non-paranormal, it's a story of my aunt's where the biggest coy wolf she had ever seen stares down her dogs in their fenced-in yard. Later a trapper captured him and sent him to a dog running place where they train hunting dogs to chase. Don't worry none of the wild animals are hurt there, and after they let it loose instead of running it tried to walk up to them aggressively. They got back in the truck and left. Apparently as soon as the training guy brought out the dogs, this great big male instead of running sprinted straight at the dogs and killed one and seriously injured another before the guys who already had their guns up were able to put it down. We are very sure that this big male coy wolf would have hunted my aunt and her dogs if she took them for a walk. As a guitarist in my free time, my life was usually filled with the soothing melodies of music and the rhythmic strumming of strings. Little did I know that my next mission would involve a different kind of harmony, the harmony of a well-coordinated special forces operation. My name is Jocko, and I led a seasoned special forces team known for our precision and efficiency. Our latest assignment was to protect a high-ranking defector from a rival nation. This defector possessed critical intelligence that could reshape the geopolitical landscape, and our mission was to ensure his safe extraction from a city crawling with enemy agents. The rendezvous point was an inconspicuous alley in the heart of a bustling metropolis. My team and I had spent weeks preparing for this operation, studying every inch of the city's layout, scrutinizing the enemy's known movements, and fine-tuning our tactics. This was a high-stakes game of cat and mouse, and we couldn't afford to lose. The defector, known by the code name Phoenix, had entrusted us with sensitive information that could change the course of history. His decision to defect came at a high cost. He had seen the darkness within his own government and felt the weight of his conscience bearing down on him. We had to ensure his safety at all costs. The extraction was scheduled for the dead of night, when the city's chaotic energy somewhat waned. The dimly lit alley was cloaked in shadows, and the tension was palpable as we awaited Phoenix's arrival. Our intel had suggested that the enemy had gotten wind of the defector's plans, and their agents were prowling nearby. Finally, he emerged from the darkness, his face masked with uncertainty and fear. Phoenix was a man who had lived a double life for far too long, and his trust in us was unwavering. We quickly ushered him into our waiting vehicle, all the while keeping a watchful eye on the surroundings. The city's labyrinthine streets were filled with potential threats. As we navigated the maze, it became evident that the enemy was closing in. They were determined to prevent the intelligence from falling into the wrong hands. The chase was on, and our team had to use every ounce of our training and experience to evade capture. Gunfire erupted, and we were forced to engage the enemy agents in a high-speed pursuit through the city's narrow streets. Our vehicle weaved through the urban landscape, tires screeching, while bullets whizzed past us. The mission hung in the balance, and it was clear that we were up against a formidable adversary. But we had a secret weapon in our arsenal, our unwavering determination to protect Phoenix and ensure the safety of the critical intelligence he carried. We fought relentlessly, using our training and teamwork to outmaneuver our pursuers. With each passing minute, we distanced ourselves from the enemy agents. Our radio crackled with updates from our support team, who guided us to an extraction point. The exhilaration of the chase was met with the anxious anticipation of reaching safety. As we neared the extraction point, the city's skyline disappeared in the rearview mirror, and a sense of relief washed over us. We had successfully protected Phoenix and the critical intelligence. Our mission had been a success, and the world would soon learn the truth about the rival nation's dark secrets. Back in the calm of our base, I couldn't help but reflect on the duality of my life from strumming guitars in my free time to leading special forces teams on high-stakes missions. Our work was never easy, but it was essential to safeguarding the values we held dear.
not me but my cousin in the 80s was on a camping trip with his wife. It wasn't a busy day for camping and according to my cousin, the ranger told them that they were the only ones camping there that night. Anyway, so it's getting late and my cousin said he spots something across the lake. He thought it was a bear standing, so he grabs his binoculars. It was sort of like a bear, but it was standing up on its hind legs. He said it wasn't a bear because it had a face like a 70-year-old man and the fur was longer than a bear. He thought maybe it was someone in a suit, but it disappeared quickly. Whatever it was, he was so spooked and wanted to leave the park immediately. His wife thought he was being ridiculous though and just having an overactive imagination. She had brought a shotgun and insisted that they be fine if anything happened. That night, everything is going fine until my cousin is awakened by footsteps. Now his wife is still asleep at this point, but he doesn't want to wake her. He just tries to keep still and quiet as possible. A figure approaches the tent. My cousin said he was positioned so that his head was on the corner of the tent. This figure leans down and gently presses its hand around the corner of the tent. So the figure is basically putting its hands around my cousin's head. I don't remember how long he said this lasted, but this figure eventually left. My cousin said it smelled like mechanical things, like someone working on a car, although he heard no car. The next morning, everything at the campsite was untouched, no problems at all. My cousin didn't mention anything about finding footprints, and there wasn't any evidence that someone had been there. He eventually went and researched the area and discovered that their camping area is supposedly a hotspot for Bigfoots and such. He firmly believes that he saw some kind of Sasquatch. I'm not sure if I believe him. If anything, I always thought it was just a person messing with him. I actually have several other stories, but I didn't want a post to drag on, and I thought it would be too overwhelming. In the early spring of 1995, a friend of mine and I had just finished a construction job in Vancouver, Washington, and were heading back home to Oklahoma. We left Vancouver in the late afternoon and made our way down the highway that runs parallel to the Columbia River. I cannot remember the hash of the road just after dark we approached what the sign said was the Columbia River Gorge. Seeing as how it was dark, we did not see much. The road started to bend south a bit, and we came to the first incline, and in the headlights of my truck appeared this figure. At first I thought it was some animal that was crossing the road, but as we got closer and the lights of the truck became more focused on it, we realized that it was not a common animal. It looked to be about three to four feet tall with the strangest red-colored hair covering its body. But the thing is, it was sitting in the road facing us with one leg straight out and the other leg out to its right side, and it was trying to push itself up as if it had been hit by a car. Well, I had to swerve into the other lane to avoid hitting the poor thing. All this took place in about a minute or so. My friend and I never said a word until after it was over a minute or so. I said, Charlie, did you see that? And he replied, I wasn't going to say nothing till you said something. But yes, we thought right off of going back, but had decided that since it was so small that mother could be nearby, and we both being avid hunters were armed, but what we saw was no mule deer or bear or anything else that we had stalked in the past. So we kept driving just to be on the safe side. Back when I was in high school, some friends and I went out to get some food at about 2 a.m. While we were driving, one friend said something like, Why us that guy out jogging at 2 a.m. dressed like that? We looked and sure enough there was what looked like a guy dressed in all black including pants and a hoodie. We live in Phoenix and even at 2 a.m. during the summer, it's way too hot to be dressed like that. After about 30 seconds of this guy jogging by us, though the driver mentioned that. A guy's I'm going 45. How is he keeping up with us? We took the first turn we could and to this day I still don't know who what that was.
I was just out for a Sunday stroll in the near woods when I suddenly stood in front of something that looked like a single huge boar with terrifying tusk. Maybe 20-30 meters away, and as I didn't have my glasses on it was a bit blurry. It was so tall and stood so still that I took it for some kind of fake or overstuffed taxidermy. I wondered why someone would place an oversized boar in our forest and walk towards in order to see if there were some hidden cameras or stuff like that. When I was 10-12 meters away the boar gave noise and I froze. For me it was surreal because that animal was definitely too big to be a wild boar in a small forest near a bigger town of Central Europe. I have seen big ones up to a shoulder high of nearly one meter, but that thing was in another league standing 1.6 meters tall. Because it had a little bit high ground we were at eye level. I assumed a very elaborate prank and watched closely for hidden speakers, but was too afraid to move on. I finally found my glasses and put them one giving the prank bore an unsettling depth of detail. Then the bore moved in a way no servo or hidden wires could have done, and I came to the slow realization that the giant a few meters away was indeed a Huxilla with tusks like daggers. There was only one time that my heart did the same reaction, and that was when I accidentally shocked myself with 230 VSC. It just stopped for a moment. With the adrenaline finally kicking in, I got my heartbeat back and noped out in a firm and steady march frenetically littering everything in my backpack on the ground. I hoped that something would seem more interesting or eatable than me. I was too afraid to look back and walked on until I got to the next road where I stopped the next car. I got into the front passenger seat and told the friendly woman that had stopped for me to please, please drive on. She was so kind to bring me to my parked car and the little parking space was full of cars and men. Turned out a prized Carpathian boar named Edgar was on the loose, and this was the rescue party because the regional ranger had told the owner that he will shoot him if he ever saw Edgar in his forest again. I told him where I had encountered Edgar, and they got him with a tranquilizer gun while he was eating my lunch. Learned that day how big Carpathian boars can become, and that Edgar was a nice guy most of the time and a little bit of a giant Houdini too. But dear God did that boar freak me out, and I cursed a bit that we sold the guns I inherited when we moved to the city. This happened nearly two years ago. I live Oklahoma and I'm sure most of you have heard of the Bever family murders that took place in Broken Arrow, Oklahoma, a few years ago. I would link a news article about it, but I'm too scared to even do that. Fall of 2016 was my first semester of college. I was an hour and a half away at college and decided to come home for the weekend to see my ex and one of my friends. We loved going into abandoned places, and somehow the Bever house was brought up. It was definitely still talked about because it was so horrible. My friend knew where the house was, so we decided to drive by it. At this point, we had no intention of going in it. This was my second time ever seeing the house. We arrived and I parked my car at the end of the street. I had my camera with me and I recorded the entire thing. First we went up to the house to just look in the windows. What really freaked me out was that the blinds were drawn and you could see into every room. There was a ceiling fan on in the kitchen and a light on in one of the back bedrooms on the first floor. It got worse. We then noticed the floors were ripped up, the cabinets in the kitchen ripped out, and there were a ton of cutouts in the walls. Why? All of the blood. My ex decided to wiggle a doorknob on a door that lead into the garage, and for some reason it was unlocked. All of the other doors to the house were locked, and had those lock boxes on them like the house was for sale or something. So it was super weird that the door was just unlocked. When he opened it, he walked into the garage and went straight to the door to the house that lead into the kitchen. It was also unlocked. Like I said, I recorded the entire thing. I don't have it saved on my computer, but I did upload it to a YouTube channel and it's unlisted so that way I can send the link to people who are curious. If anyone would like that, just let me know. Once we got into the house, I felt very odd. 
It was so dark and heavy in there for obvious reasons. We made our way through the kitchen and living room and eventually up the stairs, along the way getting even more creeped out because of all of the little cutouts in the walls from the blood. Once we got upstairs, we noticed a door that was locked, but the light was on in the room. We were not able to open it. We eventually left, and then like the smart people we are, got two more friends with us and went back for a second time. The two people who came with us the second time were too scared to go in, so they waited in the driveway. That means that they were not able to see the door we entered or the kitchen at all because of the way the garage is placed. It protrudes from the house. The second time we went in, we just stayed in the kitchen and my ex was talking out loud to the spirits. We heard footsteps upstairs. I caught a high-pitched scream in the video and like I said, I'll link it if anyone wants. As soon as we walked out, the two friends in the driveway asked how it was and asked my friend that went in with me why she didn't respond to their text. She pulls out her phone and they had texted and asked if we were upstairs. Why? Because they saw someone standing in an upstairs window. Keep in mind, we only stayed in the kitchen. We sprinted to my car. The next day I felt so weird. Long story short, I went to this spiritual bookstore and talked to the owner, and he saged us. It was absolutely horrifying. One of my friends did not get saged, and she called us later that night and told us she was driving to the Bever house and didn't know why. Something was definitely attached to us. It was a chilly day in May when my two friends and I decided to embark on a camping trip at Skookum Lake located in the Cascades about 20 air miles southeast of Estacada, Oregon. We were looking forward to catching crawfish and enjoying the solitude of the remote location. The snow had made the roads almost impassable, but our four-wheel drive managed to get us through to our campsite. After setting up camp, we spent the day fishing and exploring the area. As night fell, we huddled around the campfire, swapping stories and enjoying each other's company. The peaceful silence of the wilderness was a welcome break from our daily lives. However, in the early hours of Monday, May 22, 1995, the peace was shattered. I began to hear the unmistakable sound of branches breaking in the distance. My curiosity peaked. I grabbed my powerful flashlight and shined it toward the source of the noise. About 150 feet away, I saw something I never expected to encounter a Bigfoot. The creature was about seven feet tall, with glowing yellow eyes in the light. Its fur was black, but its head and shoulders were a much lighter color. The creature appeared to be side-stepping down a slope, and as I watched in awe, it froze in place. For forty-five minutes, the Bigfoot stood there, not moving, even when I called my buddies over to witness the sight. They were just as astonished as I was, and we could hardly believe what we were seeing. Two days later, I returned to the area with plaster, hoping to find any evidence of the creature's presence. I discovered a partial track not in the snow, measuring 21 inches in length. The large toe was clearly visible, and I carefully made a cast of the print. While searching the area, I also found two hand-sized droppings wrapped in a silky membrane. It appeared to be some sort of mold, and I collected the samples for further examination. Upon returning to our campsite, I noticed a large finger or toe print on my dark green 1977 Ford, right next to a small dent. I decided to lift the print using tape and flour, but not before asking a friend to take a close-up photograph of the evidence. With the track, droppings, and the print on my truck, I planned to bring everything to the local bookshop for examination. I hoped that these findings would help shed light on the elusive creature that had captivated our imaginations and left us with an unforgettable experience. I had a tenant living in basement, but he got into a car accident about three minutes walking from the house and passed away at the scene. At first I didn't know about this. But one night, I think it was no more than three days after the accident, the lights in our house were all flickered for exactly three times in a minute. But that's not all. I went to the bathroom later after my mom, 
the door wasn't locked. But as I was pushing the door, I felt a strong force behind the door pushing against me. At first I thought I hallucinated, but I tried for the second time and the door just didn't move. I pushed it really hard, but it still didn't move. I think I even heard a chuckle. Then I started talking with my mind saying, whoever you are, we didn't do anything wrong. Why are you messing with me? This is not funny. Then that force went away. After that, I went on the internet, typed in his name, then found out the accident. That was the only time the door jammed. I had heard stories and rumors about strange creatures lurking in the vast wilderness of Yellowstone National Park, but as a seasoned park ranger, I had never encountered anything beyond the ordinary. That all changed one fateful day when I embarked on a routine patrol that would forever alter my perception of the park's mysteries. As I roamed the rugged terrain, my keen eyes scanning the surroundings, I noticed an unusual movement in the distance. There, among the trees, stood a towering figure about eight or nine feet tall. It was a shadowy silhouette, an enigma against the backdrop of the dense forest. My heart quickened with curiosity and fear, for I had never seen anything quite like it before. The creature's too long, skinny legs seemed to support its massive frame effortlessly. Its arms were elongated, nearly reaching the ground, and just as slender as the rest of its body. Its appearance was both surreal and unsettling, like something out of a terrifying nightmare. The most unnerving aspect was its face, or rather, the complete lack thereof. There was no discernible facial features, just a long, skinny neck leading up to a head that appeared to be featureless. The absence of any eyes, nose, or mouth sent a shiver down my spine. I instinctively reached for my camera, hoping to capture this extraordinary sighting. As I aimed, the creature seemed to sense my presence, turning its formless head in my direction. Fear gripped me, but I was determined to document this inexplicable encounter. In an instant, the creature reacted, as if aware of my intentions. Without warning, it sprinted into the woods with incredible speed, disappearing among the trees. My heart pounded as I tried to follow, but it was futile the creature was gone leaving me with only my own stunned disbelief. I couldn't shake the feeling that I had just witnessed something beyond explanation. Was this a creature of folklore, an urban legend come to life? My mind raced through possibilities, but there was no denying the image burned into my memory. As days turned into weeks, I became consumed by the sighting. I pored over books and articles, searching for any mention of similar encounters. The more I read, the more convinced I became that I had come face to face with Bigfoot, the legendary creature said to roam the wilderness. The skepticism of my fellow rangers and the public weighed heavily on me, but I couldn't dismiss what I had seen with my own eyes. My determination to find proof of Bigfoot's existence grew, and I launched my own private investigation. Armed with cameras, audio recorders, and an unwavering belief in the unknown, I delved deeper into the secluded corners of the park. I tracked footprints, collected hair samples, and set up motion-activated cameras, hoping to capture undeniable evidence. Days turned into weeks, and still, the mysterious creature eluded me. The more I searched, the more elusive it seemed. Doubt crept into my mind was I chasing a mere illusion born from a moment of excitement. Just as I was on the brink of giving up, fate intervened. On a crisp morning, I discovered fresh tracks in the muddy ground. My heart leaped with excitement as I followed the trail. It led me deeper into the wilderness, far from the well-trodden paths. As I ventured further, I heard an eerie rustling in the bushes ahead. My breath caught in my throat as I prepared to face whatever was lurking behind the foliage. But instead of the shadowy figure I had encountered before, I found myself face to face with a majestic elk its imposing antlers casting eerie shadows on the forest floor. Thanks for listening. Hope you already fallen asleep. See you tomorrow at the same time.